good morning, good afternoon, or whatever time it is uh, for you in the world this uh, today. Welcome to the second day of the Yale Center for British Arts, uh, JMW Turner State of the Field Symposium. My name is Sarah Mead Leonard. I'm a postdoctoral associate in research uh, at the Yale Center for British Art. Really excited to have you all here joining us today and be going into three wonderful panels hearing about early Turner, curating Turner, and economy, ecology, and language. Uh, I will say very quickly, we are in a webinar. We are recording. There will be closed captioning um, attendees. If you have questions, please check, uh, type them into the Q&A box. The chairs of the panels will see those and be able to relay those to the speakers at the end of each session when we have our Q&A sessions. Uh, you won't be able to chat or raise your hand or things that you might be familiar with from other Zoom sessions. So the Q&A box is where to go. And with that, we're ready to get started. So I will hand it straight off to Martin. Thanks. David and me, thank you very much, Sarah. And um, welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, whichever applies. Um, I'm Martin Myron from the uh, Paul Mellor Centre uh, in London, and it's my uh, great pleasure to be able to introduce uh, panel three of the conference as a whole, panel one today, um, featuring two speakers who have um, contributed, I think, very significantly to scholarship on British landscape painting uh, over the last decade or more, um, both uh, and um, uh, Leo Costello and John Bonehill both of whom have published extensively exploring British landscape painting um, in relationship to themes around the relationship between art and history, aesthetics and the social world, landscape and topography. And both have really kind of explored the functions of landscape painting in relation to different genres, different kind of modes of understanding and knowledge in uh, really most fascinating ways. So uh, we are going to take uh, uh, the papers in turn, Leo first, and then John, um, and we'll uh, watch out for questions. As uh, Sarah said, do post them in the Q&A function, and we'll take questions at the end for um, our two speakers. We're going to start with uh, Leo Costello. Uh, Leo is uh, Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of Art History at Rice University in Houston, Texas. I mean, he's published widely on British art from the 18th century right through to the 21st centuries, um, including uh, work as a curator, as well as um, uh, writing on the sculptor Raymond Mason, and uh, also, and most pertinently for today, uh, a very important book, J.M. Turner, J.M.W. Turner and the Subject of History from 2012. He also, in his biography, promises a new book on early, on early Turner, which I trust this paper is going to um, reflect. So um, over to you, Leo, and your presentation with a early Turner. Thanks so much, Martin, um, for that introduction. Um, I'm so pleased to be here. I'm going to share my screen, hopefully successfully. Okay, is that working? Yes, that's perfect. Right, muted, but that is, yes. That wonderful, is. wonderful, cheers. Um, so thanks to Martin for that. Thanks to everyone um, for joining us on a Saturday, uh, if you're in the States on a Saturday morning. Um, and thanks um, to the Yale Center um, for hosting this, um, and especially to Sarah and Gemma for all of their uh, support. A webinar like this, um, though it may not appear it, um, is an incredible amount of work and they've handled it. so. Um, so capably, I'm so grateful to that. Uh, and thanks to our presenters yesterday um, for a number of uh, really great papers, which um, had, I thought, important implications for early Turner um, from uh, the papers which talked about the um, still growing incredible resources that we may have for research. Uh, to papers from Toba Auckland Peck and Frederic Auger, which have significant uh, implications. So my paper um, is um, meant to be, uh, and does come out of the work I'm doing, but really is meant to be uh, not a definitive statement about uh, where I think early Turner studies should go uh, or will go, but rather um, want a reflection on some of the disciplinary stakes of the category 
and two, a gesture really intended as a gesture at one direction of uh, what it might look like if we uh, began to rethink that category. So I'll launch in. Uh, this paper will argue via the relatively understudied early period of Turner's work up to say 1819, that he's an artist perhaps uniquely positioned to benefit from methodologies that may at least initially appear to be not primarily art historical, such as ecological and disability studies to name just two. We've heard already and we'll hear more uh, about ecology here. Uh, and certainly in part my focus my goal is to focus on what this approach can suggest for early Turner specifically. Even more, however, I'd like to offer early Turner as a demonstration of the way in which such methodologies and the issues they may allow us to raise are not in fact to be seen as external to the discipline, but rather as having been systematically excluded from it in part by the same discursive dynamics that produced the early late Turner concept in the first place. Accordingly, I'm certainly interested in at least gesturing towards an undoing of the early late distinction. But rather than claim some legitimacy for an early work like the 1809 London from Greenwich Park on the terms by which the late works have been often valued, namely formal innovativeness and apparent aesthetic modernism, my goal is to interrogate the disciplinary, and here I use the term in its Foucauldian sense, investments in the very idea of early versus late Turner looking at a picture like London, unhooked from this dichotomy, for instance, offers a rich set of possibilities for a newly much more expansive and critical notion of modernity in which discourses like ecology and disability were already present and also still emerging. Um, and again, I would emphasize that I place this work also in relation to the excellent work that's been done lately uh, on late Turner um, and which has really expanded uh, the frame of reference uh, in those works. So to begin, uh, ideas of early and late were already in play during Turner's lifetime. In 1820, reviewing an exhibition at Walter Fox's townhouse, which featured Turner's work from the previous two decades, the Annals of the Fine Arts invoked a distinct sense of, of decline linked to an emergent early late distinction saying, quote, Turner appears here in his original splendor and to his greatest advantage. Those who only know this artist of late and from his academical works will hardly believe the grandeur, simplicity and beauty that pervade his best works in this collection. The early works of Turner before he visited Rome and those which he has done since for this collection are like works by a different artist. The former natural, simple and effective, the latter artificial, glaring and affected he really should look back at some of these works and keep nearer their truth, end quote. This is remarkable uh, for many reasons for its early mention of decline, but also in that it splits the early work into a preferred group, the watercolors of the aughts especially, and the quote, academical ones about which nothing else is really said. The notion of Turner's decline from early naturalness into artificiality became one of the standard critical tropes of the last three decades of his career. But while, even while it favors early over late at this point, the Annals model actually lays the groundwork for the reversal of valuation that will take place in which late is eventually favored over early. In the Annals account, the early work is frozen in place, a stable naturalism rather than academicism against which to compare a more dynamic, if regrettably so at this point, later period. Soon after Turner's death and the accounts of Ruskin and others continuing into the 20th century with modernist writers, of course, a preference for the later work steadily overtook the earlier preference for the earlier Turner. This process has been expertly charted by Sam Smiles, so I won't rehearse it here except to say that Turner's early work came increasingly to be seen as a period of studentship for authors like Ruskin in which the artist tried, quote, not so much to invent new things as to rival old ones, end quote. Even more directly against this backward looking academic artist, modernist writers steadily shifted to a preference for later Turner. And key to this was a sense of Turner's originality and formal innovativeness, which would overtake a focus on his naturalism. It is interesting then um, to note the extent to which public opinion has largely continued to share this preference, as well as a sense of disappointment at times regarding early work. 
um, even as ex exhibitions like uh, the 2014 painting Set Free have sought to reframe our understanding of Lake Turner. This is evident in a look at the sometimes fascinating world of online reviews of Turner and the Tate. One discovers there at times a sense of missed or lost experience, often linked to an unexpected encounter with early Turner. On TripAdvisor, for instance, in 2015, Jean at home was let down by the display on a return visit saying, quote, I will never forget my first visit to the Tate, walking down a hallway and seeing a room full of dazzling paintings, full of shining light. I thought to myself, oh, they have a room full of Monet's and was discovered <clears throat> and was amazed to discover that they were in fact Turner's. Those are the paintings that are missing. Prown 67 wrote in 2019, I'm an artist illustrator. So I was hoping this would be of interest. I was primarily going for the Turner collection, wish I'd not bothered. If you like your Turner classical and biblical, then you're in for a treat. Looking for the later popular Turner, then so sorry, not here. Reactions like these um, repeatedly invoke an experiential response to later Turner pictures that is found missing often in the early work and is rooted in what Timothy Morton has described as ecomimesis. For Morton, ecomimesis immerses the viewer in the natural environment created in a work of art, all the better to allow that viewer to suspend an awareness of our own position in a very real world. Paradoxically, ecomimesis attempts to avoid appearing to represent an environment by actually creating an environment via its own representational means. The implications for this for Turner, particularly the kind of Turner sought by the museum goers above, are easy to see. It explains a lot, for instance, about the classic comparison of Turner's immersive fall of an avalanche in the Grissons and Delethaborg's more descriptive avalanche in the Alps. As the Tate's website succinctly summarizes, quote, yet far from attempting reportage, Turner creates an almost abstract scene of elemental forces, end quote. One of the elements that has made Turner, late Turner especially, appear most modern is precisely this ability to create these compelling environments. Snowstorm, Steamboat Off a of Harbor's Mouth, is perhaps the poster child for Turnerian ecomimesis, which he himself invoked famously by wishing, according to Ruskin, that his critics had been in it. Did Turner mean the storm, which he also claimed to have been in, or the painting, or both? The line, like everything here, has become blurred, and confusion is the point. Um, and I would add uh, with this that um, I'm, I don't want to be reductive relative to this painting or late Turner and to hold it up and late Turner up as a kind of straw man against early Turner, which is what's happened um, to early Turner. Um, and so we can think, you know, it's a like any Turner picture, a complex, multivalent. Um, document. And so we can think, for instance, of Sarah Gould, who we'll hear from later, and her uh, fascinating study of the way um, in which Turner incorporated the material of pollution um, into the immersive uh, material experience of the painting. But one implication of this, returning to Morton, is that ecomimesis is a product of an industrial era idea of nature, held on a pedestal as a kind of elevated experience an alternate immersive aesthetic environment that enables viewers to blind ourselves to the actual destruction of the environment that we are in fact causing. It's for this reason that Morton calls for an ecology without nature. Alan Braddock has recently incorporated this idea and the attendant notion of an ambient aesthetics into a reading of Monet's London series, which argues that the undeniably lush atmospheric renderings, and rendering is a word Morton makes much of, quote, rather than offering a cogent meditation on climate or other in urgent environmental issues, leveraged local foggy conditions to produce a generalized abstract sensation of weather through ambient aesthetics, end quote. I'm not at all interested in holding Turner individually accountable in this kind of critique, which is I think ultimately limited in scope, especially given that we are all implicated at some level in it. Rather, I'd like to point out that ideas of both technological progress and its opposite construction, nature, are products of the very same set of conditions that produced the modernist valuation of Turner's own progress towards a transcendent late style. 
Turner in this account is both the subject of this larger discursive politics and a powerful figure in giving it form. All of this brings me to London. From a late, later Turner perspective, the picture may appear to perform, or perhaps better not a form, perform exactly as expected. It's a modestly sized, initially rather unassuming painting that lacks, um, by that perspective, the formal and surface dynamism of the snowstorm, or may be seen to contain kernels of it that would develop later. Um, the horizon line cuts the vertical axis almost exactly in half, and the left tower of Wren's Hospital is just visible there, um, <clears throat> is just slightly right of center. Combined with the alignment of strokes along the visible grid of the canvas in many places, there is an almost geometrical sense of stability to the painting. At the same time, however, the picture as one begins to look at it closely doesn't seem particularly well rooted in references to contemporary London or representations of it. As Andrew Hemingway has discussed when it was shown at Turner's gallery, it was part of a series of pictures of the Thames from the valley upriver of London to the estuary. As the only picture of the river actually depicting London, however, it seems to rather highlight the absence of the much metropolis in the series more than remedy it, with the city only dimly visible in the distance. Alex Potts notes the distinction between the verses Turner attached to the picture, which invoke a more troubled view, speaking of a quote, murky veil and busy toil, obscuring London's beauty and denying its form. And the picture itself, um, which he says required a viewer to bring prior knowledge um, of um, discourses like increasing air pollution uh, in London um, that viewers needed to bring that knowledge to actually connect it to the painting. Uh, but it's the disjuncture um, that interests me most rather than the way it was bridged. Um, because to me, it doesn't um, match well to uh, the verses and the ideas that invoke from the um, relative lack of crowded sail on a burdened Thames, um, a large swath of which we see here is quite clear of traffic um, to the white areas around and in front of St. Paul's, which are ostensibly a reflection of the clouds and fog above, but read more or more simply like areas of white paint. If London appears to almost disappear under Turner's view, Greenwich is in its way also curiously undefined. As John Bonehill and Stephen Daniels have described, there was an ample history for imagery of Greenwich, which Turner gestures at here, but never quite elaborates. There are the large ships, here, which could refer, for instance, to the wider colonial and imperial world, but which Turner seems determined to almost totally obscure behind the hospital. There are the usual frolicking couples, but they are so curiously small as to be almost unreadable. The relative sparseness of the imagery here is immediately clear on comparison to both typical 18th century rendering of the scene on the bottom right, and especially Turner's own 1825 drawing at the Met at the top left, done from a few hundred yards to the southeast on Observatory Hill. Bonehill and Daniels have wonderfully explored the complexity of this latter image with its numerous figures, busy river traffic, and multi-layered references to London's urban transformations. In 1809, however, Turner seems to have at hand neither the unquestioning self-evident sensibility of the early image, nor the witty complexity of the later one. Instead, and I think we have to condition ourselves to see this as its modernity, the 1809 London displays a distinct hesitancy about adopting any kind of narrative at all. Stephen Daniels and Dennis Cosgrove have spoken of landscape as a quote, pictorial way of representing, structuring or symbolizing surroundings. It is exactly representation that breaks down in this picture. It is neither a celebration of London's remarkable economic or and technological progress as an imperial capital, nor lament for the loss of previous natural innocence at the hands of an encroaching urbanism, as in George Cruikshank's later image of Hampstead, in which the country is subsumed by marching London. Turner's hesitancy here is also immediately visible in comparing the picture to the print that was done after it that would appear in the Liber Studiorum. Subtle changes, the removal of trees, 
to the right of the Queen's House, the addition of river traffic, the greater definition of buildings in London, all combined to more effectively define London and Greenwich themselves and also against each other and highlight the lack of definition in the painting. In this regard, we must note also the painting's very incomplete evocation of ecomimesis, and thus its refusal to create an easy vision of nature to be contrasted with the human, an other against which to define self. There are signs here to be sure. We are situated not at the summit of One Tree Hill, but about 30 to 40 feet down the hill to the right. This places us not in an abstract space above the scene, but points to a place in it, akin to the deer who are the only definite sentient presences in the picture. The sweeping clouds also evoke an emergent ambient aesthetics, but all this remains implicit and ill-defined. The picture keeps us at arm's length from everything it shows, even the attentive deer. As visually different as they will look when I show them to you uh, in a moment, the best comparisons for London to me are certain paintings that were similarly hesitant, not just about the means of representation, but crucially about its very stakes relative to modernity. We can think here, for instance, of Tim Clark's assessment of Manet's 1874 Boaters Argentie, in which it is precisely the lack of order in the suburban environment that Manet found visual form for, as well as Jonathan Crary's reading of the 1879 in the conservatory, as a figuration of a conflict in modernity around changing ideas of vision and attentiveness. But London reminds me of nothing so much as a Giacometti portrait of the 1950s and 60s, as though, like Giacometti before his sister, the more, <laughs> sitter, the more um, often his brother, in fact, the more Turner looked, really looked at any of this, the farther away it all got from the means by which he might represent it. And it's notable that all three of these uh, works are ones that, like Turner's early, early works, have been relatively marginalized in the herbs of their respective uh, artists, treated as outside of the mainstream of modernist contribution of more canonical work. The modernity lies um, not in the transcendence then here of either tradition or the social and environmental issues of a rapidly expanding London, but rather precisely in its steadfast refusal to visually invoke the narratives, positive or negative, that arose to organize a response to those changes. The picture seems determined to create the expectation of narratives only to stop short of actually providing them. From Morton's perspective, moreover, those very narratives, positive or negative, are but two sides of the same coin in which progress is either celebrated or lamented by way of a created idea of nature, which is, which is the other to a human urban self. Modernism in art with its valuation of eco-mimetic landscapes, Turner's included, is driven by this same sense of progressive transcendence, which masks very real exploitations. And to be sure um, with all of this, uh, you know, I, I'm well aware that as um, Daniels and Bonehill have noted, Turner himself um, not only profited from, but participated in the wave of metropolitan improvement and modernization. I'm also aware that vistas like Richmond Hill on the Prince Regent's birthday strike a very different, much more self-assuredly celebratory tone. I'm therefore not making um, a claim for some kind of criticality um, that exists across all of Turner's work, be it early or late, um, but rather finding um, particular moments of hesitancy, um, especially about representation uh, within it. And it's exactly the complex and contradictory subjectivity in the face of modernity that interests me most in Turner. In closing, it is for this reason also that I have focused on the methodological possibilities of early Turner. Turner's career was coincident with so many emerging discourses of the Foucauldian regimes of surveillance and discipline. And I think probably for a variety of reasons, he seems to have been at least at times uniquely sensitive to their presence and power. It's interesting in, uh, to note in this regard that Richard Johns has pointed to the Foucauldian quality of Turner's pictures of the Thames estuary, a number of which were shown with London in 1809. 
It is my argument elsewhere also that the wariness of the 1800 self-portrait, which I read is its determination to give nothing away while appearing to do the opposite, to open himself for full view, is driven precisely by Turner's lived experience of these regimes. As I originally conceived it, this paper would also have touched on the possibilities, for instance, of disability studies, which identifies the emergence at the same moment of normative medical ideas of both mental and physical bodies and health. I don't have time to elaborate here, but the implications of this for Turner, both late and early, are many. Finally, I'm very committed to the question of this paper's title, and the particular attention I've paid to the ecological implications of London is just one example of many possible inquiries. And I should say finally that I don't mean to appear to deny, of course, the presence of change in Turner's work over time. As we have seen, he would bring powerful form um, to a variety of different approaches that would transform landscape painting with multiple implications. But the eco-mimetic and ambient aesthetics, which provide so much of the impact of his later work and its formal assurance were born of, were indeed a response to the very same conditions of ecological change that gave the painter such hesitancy or in the earlier picture. I think we are obliged to take both with equal seriousness and to refuse the elaboration of the progressive early late split in Turner as a means to mask other deeper, far more destructive discursive movements in modernity. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lear, for such a, a, a wonderful paper, which I'm uh, not appearing, but there I am, <laughs> which um, you don't need to see me anyway, um, which um, combines such kind of close visual attention with uh, a very kind of expansive sense of the, the methodological historiographical questions about how we organize our understanding of of Turner and Turner's relationship with modernity, a lot, to, a lot to take from that. A fantastic start to the day, so thank you. Um, a reminder to um, everybody listening in and watching that um, you can post questions for the speakers at any time in the Q&A and we'll address them um, at the end of this uh, panel. Um, after our second um, presentation on this panel from John Bonehill. Um, John teaches art history at the University of Glasgow um, and he has published extensively on um, art and culture of the long 18th century, um, especially um, on questions around landscape and around topography uh, and this includes many works but um, it's probably worth kind of flagging uh, what I think we can now think of as a, as a seminal exhibition and publication on Sand Bay from, from 2008 which I think really did kind of um, uh, open a new era in, in British landscape studies. Um, he's currently working on a study of domestic sketching tours and is completing a book titled The Face of the Country, A State Portraiture in Britain, 1660 to 1832. And his paper today is J.M.W. Turner and the Landed Estate. So over to you, John. Thank you very much, Martin. And thank you to Leo uh, as well. And I hope that some of the things I uh, might say today kind of resonate with um, uh, Leo's wonderful paper. I also want to uh, take the opportunity to thank the L Centre for organising um, this, this symposium and more particularly to uh, Gemma and Sarah for making this such a, 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 a pleasure to be involved in. So let me just quickly share my screen. And fingers crossed it works. There we go. Okay, so um, views of landed property or, or what, what is termed estate portraits are a major aspect of Turner's early to mid career with scenes set on and about aristocratic and gentry seats featuring prominently among works submitted for public exhibition. The list from the first decade of the new century alone included and is by no means confined to, I'm going to do a kind of quick run through of various images here, a set of five watercolours of William Beckford's spectacular Font Hill in Wiltshire, which was intriguingly then still under construction in 1800. They would also, that list would also include the companion pictures of Sir John Fleming Lester's Cheshire estate of Tabley, 
um, uh, which was shown in 1809, a morning view of Petworth, which was interestingly shown alongside two further estate views of um, Lowther Castle up in um, the Lake District in 1810. And then moving into the second decade of the uh, new century, Turner um, embarked then on an extensive documentation of Sir Walter Falk's Farnley Hall on the banks of the wharf in the Yorkshire's West Riding, a number of which took center stage in that exhibition held at his townhouse in 1819 and 1820 that Leo referred to at the beginning of his paper. Um, stays at Turnley would also lead to related commissions, notably for a view of the Earl of Darlington's Rabbi Castle in County Durham, which was um, shown at the RA in 1818. Now, those of you who um, uh, were uh, listened into the symposium yesterday will know that this particular picture was um, uh, was was the was the prompt for a, a little discussion around Turner's um, 1818 exhibits. The picture being shown alongside um, uh, a view of the field of Waterloo and also the Dort painting. And it just as a kind of aside to that or uh, add on to that conversation, it's worth pointing out maybe that actually uh, at least one critic did make the connection between the slaughter on the field of Waterloo and the slaughter of, uh, uh, of uh, taking place in the hunt in this picture. The picture that we see here, it should be said, is not the picture that was exhibited in 1818, which had more foregrounded the, um, the kill, and which in the revised version that you see here is, is pushed back. It seems that even uh, the famous fox killing Earl of Darlington um, uh, seemed to have balked at the uh, degree of violence that was in that picture originally. Now that's a, a bit of a kind of digression, but I could go on right into the 1820s and take in other kinds of images of uh, landed property, not made for exhibition, but for print for the print market. Scenes on Scottish estates such as the Apples Don Keld, or um, or indeed neglected properties such as Pope's Villa uh, about to be demolished. But rather than take you through some more or less familiar images. I'd just like to pause and reflect a little on um, this selection of the images that we've just uh, uh, flicked through. Um, first of all, the thing to say about a state portrait is it was extremely lucrative. That uh, The Royal Academician Joseph Farrington, you know, in advising a young artist on what career path to take, says there's a lot of money to be had in the making of landscape portraits, as he calls them. And it was lucrative. The um, Tabley Hall pictures, for instance, Turner seems to have uh, got 250 guineas a piece for these, it was, so it was rumoured. But I think the pictures are also striking for other reasons. That the, um, there's a startling variety of geographies and topographies I think, involved in these pictures. Sites in northern and southern counties, neatly manicured parkland settings and rugged woodland, historic and modern houses about to be demolished and still in progress. Um, but I'd also note the range of narrative incidents and imagery of labor and leisure, profit and pleasure, of literary and pictorial illusion as well as painterly effects in evidence. The references to old and modern masters, for instance, notably Rubens and these Hetstein views in the view of Rabbi, for instance. There's also allusions to the times of day tradition, pastoral and Georgic poetry, as well as a concern, as already been noted, with transitory weather conditions, et cetera, et cetera. There are also pictures, I think, dense with information about settlement and situation, the history, and indeed also the present day use of the landscape. Um, 
Frederick Auger yesterday made the point that he thought of this as a kind of history painting. But I think it's very much more a kind of reflection on maybe the place of that history, the place of the past in a, in a, in a modernizing present. This is a landscape which has just been radically set out for the purposes of the newly fashionable sport of fox hunting. So they're pictures about change and development, as well as, I think, pictures about connection, uh, both connections, both imaginative and material, with places elsewhere. They're kind of both closely observed and also highly inventive, marrying detailed matters of fact with a broad range of illusions or elements from other genres that work to amplify the meaning and significance of the locality depicted. Obviously, then, what I'm suggesting is that these are pictures of considerable range and scope that would warrant and reward sustained scrutiny. By and large, however, and with the odd exception, these are not a works that have received examination of that kind. My concern here, then, is to briefly reassess the place of this highly complex, but also, as we'll see, contentious and oftentimes overlooked category of picture making in turn as practice in historiography. The discussion that, as many of you will probably soon pick up, that leads takes its lead from the recent um, scholarly uh, reappraisal of topography as a genre and exemplified by the British Library's Picturing Places project on website, overseen by Felicity Marone, which has so effectively complicated and enriched our understanding of topography as a field of knowledge. Where topography, I think, has come to be understood as less about a matter of fact observation and tabulation of a place, and more a way of knowing, a form of inquiry and social practice that was critical and evaluative. And Turner's views of landed estates are, I think, critical and evaluative. Another reflection of the artist's interest in society, both high and low that was talked about so much in yesterday's plenary, and a society also in which patronage, including the patronage of art and artists, patrons like the Earl of Darlington, an issue which has perhaps yet to be discussed in, in, in this um, symposium, really mattered. Dealing with matters of land access and use, Turner's estate pictures resonate as well with modern tendencies to think of the environment as all just so much real estate, something to be parceled up, extracted and exploited. So also with the kinds of urgent ethical and political concerns flagged yesterday in Frederick and Tober's papers. Now to begin thinking about these issues, I'll uh, want to sketch something of the significance of the landed estate and its portrayal in the decades either side of 1800, as well as reflecting a little more on the status of such views, but what this tells us about the making and meaning of Turner's engagement with landscapes such as uh, that of Rabbi Castle. The state portraiture such as this celebrated aristocratic gentry power in the land. Owning land was of course more than just an economic fact or a legal concept. It articulated a certain relationship to the world, at once imaginary and lived, with pictures of the landed estates, just one of a range of cultural forms dedicated to exploring and establishing those associations. Such pictures displayed painters' patronage and skill, but also the owner's taste and encouragement for fine arts. Producing and exhibiting views of the estates of the nation's gentry and nobility was there not just an effective promotional strategy for artists like Turner, their patrons were no less concerned to, to parade the improvement of their country or suburban seats on the walls of, the walls of the London showrooms or in the volumes of prints that surveyed the nation's localities, which were separated and marked in the years after 1800. Displays of this kind helped coordinate Britain's localities and regions in people's minds as a complex but ordered and a harmonious mosaic of landed power. 
part of the polite geographies of the time also set out in maps, travel literature and poetry. Such pictures helped extol the virtues of personal property and private land ownership as the foundation of a modern society. They helped then codify the complex range of meanings landed property came to assume for their owners and viewers. For their viewers, debates over the coincidence or otherwise of landed and public interests served to make the estate a key material and scenic landscape, not just for the country's landowners, but that broader, largely urban-centered constituency who even might, though they might lack the resources to build such domains, claim membership of polite society. With landed interest often treated as if synonymous with the national interest and vice versa, the fluctuate, although that is increasingly, of course, being challenged in the age of reform, the fluctuating fortunes of estates, great and small, were taken as a measure of the relative prosperity and progress of the country at large. For its advocates, the improvement of sites, such sites generated a series of overlapping associations, not just economic, but aesthetic, of moral and social benefit, bettering the lot of those who lived in, worked or viewed the landscape. But the impact of the transformative effects of the state improvements on the appearance and the economies of the wider countryside, the cost to others, as well as sometimes to owners themselves, were also the cause of considerable unease. Sites of major capital and cultural investment, the countries, countries landed states were celebrated as models of good order, wealth and taste, but they also offered up or coexisted alongside scenes of abandonment and neglect. Unease about the degradation of the environment or the scarcity of resources, especially timber, of course, trailed improving schemes in some instances as it underwrote them in others. Depending on the point of view, developments on or about landed estates were ultimately weighed as exemplary of patriotic virtue or corrupt practice. I think here, for instance, that uh, Pope's Villa is, of course, captured here in, um, uh, in this wonderful engraving by John Pye um, as it's about to be demolished to make way for the Baroness of Baroness Howe's uh, new property and was uh, a, a development which was the cause of considerable contemporary controversy. It's all ensured then that the image of the estate had considerable cultural resonance and its pictorial treatment being part of a wider attempt then to understand the changing face of the country and attach it with meaning. Back to Rabia's castle once more. Partly because it was so blatantly commercial in motivation, as I said, it was a, a good earner. Partly as the taking of a likeness was thought a merely mechanical act. A state portraiture did not find favor in academic circles, however. Tasked with an act of servile rather than creative, oh, sorry, um, creative um, imitation, it seems as if the artist's role was simply to deceive the eye, flatter the owner, who in turn demanded only a careful tabulation of his possessions in a pictorial cadastre or map of sorts. A state portraiture was and remains closely associated with topography, with cultures of observation and documentary record, or what Turner's fellow academician Henry Fusley famously dismissed as mere map work. So work, not art. While mapping had not long been employed metaphorically as a model of comprehensive and contemplative understanding, Fusely inverted this idea, employing it as a means of figuring the limitations of too literal an outlook. There isn't time um, for me here to elaborate on the finer points of this, in any case, well-known, um, of Fusely's, in any case, well-known antipathy towards what he's commonly called views, as he said, calculated merely, quote, to delight the owners of the acres depicted, nor 
is the time to discuss the defense of map work launched with Turner's encouragement by the topographical print of Britain. Suffice to say, however, that with several of his markets implicated in Fusley's attack on different forms of place painting, Turner would seem to have been on the side of map workers. This exchange is worth recalling, not least because it points up the sense of contention around estate views of landed estates and how they figured rather troublingly, negatively even, in early 19th century debates over the direction of the national school, less as what a model of an ambitious landscape art should be and more what it ought not to be. It's also though to suggest that it, the state portraiture had a currency and I think a potency that rather belies its marginal status in the art history of the period. So despite the importance of the genre, I think, to the painter's early to mid career, not least in terms of his profile at exhibition, Turner's estate portraits have, for example, rarely been central to studies of his oeuvre. They have yet to be the focus of a themed exhibition, for example, and I, I would suggest they would work well. And I wonder if that's in part because they don't necessarily feature in the Turner bequest or other major public collections such as uh, that of held by the Yale Center. To use a term um, Julian Forrester employed yesterday when discussing the view of Rabbi Castle, such works seem to be outliers in Turner's work. They don't fit, they don't fit uh, a, a, a narrative um, such as that outlined uh, by Leo. The Petworth pictures, um, which Emily Knight will have more to say about shortly, are the exception, not least because they are seen as in some ways exception. Um, in an essay surveying the artist's country house subjects in the 2002 Turner at Petworth exhibition catalogue, which I should say is itself a rare and invaluable exception to the general picture I've painted, Ian Worrell argues that with the four great oils Turner painted in the late 1820s for Petworth's carved dining room, the artist was finally able to, quote, stand outside the standard expectations of what constituted an estate view at the outset of his career, producing a set of pictures that were, quote, more calculated projections of Egremont as a public figure rather than straightforward records of possessions. Here then, it would seem Turner was no longer constrained by the requirements uh, of the genre, requirements that the painter was obliged to marginalize if he was going to explore what Wall terms the possibilities of landscape as a subject in its own right. Leaving aside for now the point about the standard expectations of what constituted an estate view, which I think was a far richer and wider and ranging form, and often assumed, it's a neat conclusion to a progressive narrative in which, as, as Leo has just pointed out, the conventions, or in this case, requirements that characterize Turner's early work are things to be overcome and which can be made to seem merely as an extended prelude to the personalized idiosyncratic vision of the artist's late period. There are echoes here perhaps of those early 19th century debates around the making of estate portraits and other genres of landscape imagery delineating particular places where such work was something to be rejected as undemanding and basically commercial or seen as merely a stage on the way to a grander, more serious form of landscape art. But I'd maybe also suggest that one of the distinctions that underlies such a narrative in this case, that is between views of identifiable places and more to the point private property and less prosaic, more poetic forms of uh, uh, landscape art addressing the native countryside is also less than clear cut, where the line lies at which one crosses into the other is often sketched rather hesitantly staked out almost arbitrarily. I've not left myself a great deal of time here, uh, but by way of a brief conclusion, I want to look at Turner's extended pictorial survey 
of Walter Fawkes Farnley, which is by far his most detailed portrait of a state, land and life. Partly I want to do this to illustrate that uncertainty, but more as a way of furthering, uh, ex further exploring the breadth of concerns addressed by the artist's portrayal of landed property. I haven't got time, unfortunately, to address some of the less familiar, less common aspects of Turner's work, which in for Forks, which included examples of what I might term uh, heirloom portraits, and as we'll see very briefly, interior scenes. Turner made his first visit to Farnley in 1808, staying annually after that date, where a room was kept for his use. Farnley Hall itself was, you can, as you can see, a curious marriage of late Tudor manor house and fashionable Palladian architecture situated on the south-facing slopes of the Wharf Valley in Yorkshire's West Riding. The surrounding estate was vast, comprising more than 11,000 acres of tenanted farmland and a further 2,000 acres of more forest and woodland. In a view out uh, across the wharf towards Farnley from above the densely planted slopes of the Chevin Escarpment to over the river, the house sits bounded by meadows and thick woodland, hedged fields and moorland with the hills of the West Riding in the distance and the industry of Otley's waterside cotton mill in the foreground, indicated by plumes of smoke rising from below. A view from the same craggy vantage point looking southwest, so in the opposite direction, forms a companion piece and stretches out over Otley and the country beyond, including places of historic significance to the Fawkes family. Rising above the smoke from the mill that envelops and pollutes, to use that word again, the town is the steeple of Otley Parish Church, a building richly decorated with Fawkes family crests and monuments. To the north of the River Wharf, as it snakes between Otley and Ilkley, is a finely delineated image of Denton Hall, the seat of the Parliamentarian General Sir Thomas Fairfax, who the keen historian of the Civil War, Walter Fawkes, liked to claim as an illustrious kinsman. Taken together, um, the pictures survey Fawkes' historic connections with this local landscape but also the place of that past in uh, the present day, you know, rapidly changing present day. Turner's um, Wharfdales, as his patron um, fondly termed them, are nearly 50 in number. And they exhibit what, what I think um, Leo was just calling quite helpfully, a certain degree of hesitancy. They were rapidly but beautiful beautifully wrought, as one of the early biographers said, on toned paper, mixing chalk with body colour, surfaces thickened with gum and animated with stopping out, scratching, scraping and rubbing. It gives them an immediacy of a part with the marked concern to capture changing light and atmospheric conditions, contrasts and combinations of sunshine, mist, rain and storm. Subject-wise, they also um, taking the house and its interiors, as well as the working estate. We can see in the image on the top left of the dining room, for instance, the Dort uh, uh, sitting above the mantelpiece. Various passages and entrances feature, carriage drives, such as on, we see on the left well, as well. Carriage drives, tree-lined avenues, warm pathways through the woods, elegant house and park gates, stone and wooden bridges. And they all traverse a mixed landscape of gardens, parklands and woods, crags, moorland and watercourses. Views are both narrow and expansive, cropped and occluded. Allusions are made to various aspects of the estate's economies. Vegetable and fruit production, livestock and game, stone and timber. It's very much a working estate. Uh, with Turner picking out labourers, splitting and dressing rock, as well as a leisured one dedicated to restorative walks and sport, coursing and shooting and fishing. 
the state workers as well as the Foxes themselves figure significantly, performing a variety of roles and tasks, sometimes reappearing across several drawings in a way that further enhances the sense of them being a series of unfolding scenes rather than a set of discrete works. Serial formats had long been an established aspect of estate portraiture. Um, they conveyed a sense of movement as much through time as space, allowing various kinds of stories of a more or less dramatic kind to unfold between images as well as within them. The state portraiture was indeed always as much a way of telling as of seeing, a means of relating and situating stories of different kinds. Their commissioners would probably seem as often closely tied to some moment of transition or occasion commemorating change on the ground in the form of grand architectural or landscaping schemes, but also charting lives, matters of connection and pedigree, land and life. Despite a tendency for scholars to think of a state portraiture largely in terms of views of the country house, artists like Turner tasked with the portrayal of landed property were far from solely focused on its architectural and landscaped um, core their gaze was just as likely to focus on other assets and signs of ownership, features of the working estate, as well as antiquities and natural wonders of the kind featured in the Wharfdales. Brought into telling conjunction with the design core or treated separately, the portrayal of such personally, locally or nationally significant features helped elucidate the character of the place and its owner. In the mid 1790s, Fawkes had commissioned a set of now lost family views from Wilson's former pupil, William Hodges. Unhappy with Hodges' often criticized broad handling and liquid paint effects, Fawkes had complained that the views are not made like the places. He clearly thought Turner's Wharfdales better likenesses, better portraits. And indeed, when they were shown, at his uh, London townhouse in 1819 and 1820. Um, he sees them, I think, as a better portrait of himself. That exhibition was as much a triumph uh, for Fawkes as it was Turner. I'm conscious of time, so maybe I'll um, leave it there. Thank you very much, John. Again, a very a very rich and uh, careful and thoughtful paper and, and really making the case for a, a relatively overlooked uh, body of material within within Turner studies generally. Um, we've got, uh, we're due to um, run into a break before the next panel, but I think we've got time for um, one or two questions. Um, so do post in the Q&A, uh, use the Q&A function if you um, uh, would like to um, ask a question. I was going to have a question, but I see that there's actually a couple lined up already, so I should step aside. I was going to ask a question about when when early Turner is, but it's probably that's boring compared to what's actually coming through. So um, we've got a question from Tim, um, from Tim Barringer. Uh, this is for Leo, so we'll go back to Leo. Um, Thanks for the brilliant analysis of Turner's London, 1809. How does the impact of the panorama feed into your reading. Uh, the view from One Tree Hill potentially mimics that of the viewing platform in Barker's panorama in Leicester Square, which has been associated with the Foucauldian analysis of uh, visual regimes. Does Turner's ambivalence about modernity, which you were talking about and um, uh, John, you refer to as well, uh, does Turner's ambivalence about modernity derive in part from his, adopt, uh, from his adoption here, but not in England, 1819, for panoramic non-Claudian format? Yeah, um, <clears throat> short answer, I think it, I, I think his, his uh, ambivalence is very much rooted in that. And I think that the panorama um, and Turner's awareness of it um, relative to a form of viewing um, in London was really um, structural for him and, and plays strongly into that hesitancy, which I would, um, say, uh, and I think that makes a lot of sense out of those two pictures, which are otherwise a little hard to put together um, somehow. Um, and I would say also that, you know, with all of it, I think the panorama uh, and that kind of 
viewing was a result of his awareness of and suspicion of viewing as it was taking place in London and the lack of views in London um, relates to his own, um, you know, famous kind of secretiveness about not wanting to be seen um, quite frequently and about being, um, you know, very much under the radar in some ways in London while being extremely prominent on others. So yeah, thanks very much. I think that's generative. Mm -hmm. I really do think um, it, it, Sorry, if I may say Sorry, John, go on. Go I was on. going to say something. I think in, in the work that I did with Steve on the 1825 Greenwich view, I think I think we made tried to explore the connection there with yeah. panoramic modes of viewing. And I know there's that wonderful image in his lectures where he unwraps Barker's panorama to try mm -hmm. to work out how it works. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I think right. he is increasingly in the 1820s interested in that kind of broad yeah. framed, unframed view, broad angled, unframed view. Yeah. I've got a question from, from Kate Nicholson, which I think is for, for, for both panelists. Um, and is a, in a way it kind of opens up the, 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 the framing of this panel in itself, which is uh, to ask Is there a way to change the early late dichotomy for Turner? Uh, the chronological model implies a learning curve that doesn't really serve his genius. Is there another perspective that might work? Uh, question mark. I think that's a really interesting question because it's almost impossible to get away from early and late. It seems to sort of resurface. And Leo, you're sort of it resurfaces even in people's kind of online reviews as a way of framing their experience. So yeah, is there another perspective that might work? Um, I try myself using the term mid career and realize that did, nobody yeah. does that. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Yeah, I I think for me, and you know, if I'd been able to talk about disability in part, um, you know, it's exactly a kind of another framework that I that I would see as um generative, um, that just as you know, an ecological perspective would downplay progress broadly um, that you know disability so much of um, the discourse around Turner is both in a way his um, overcoming his earlier self in a sense um, and then late in his career ideas of disability have played such a role in thinking about his overcoming um, various challenges um, that that if you um, take then um, you know, from say disability studies, an approach that doesn't view things uh, medically and doesn't view impairment um, as somehow um, non-normative and to be overcome, uh, then it produces, uh, you know, a much more complex um, kind of model. So um, I'd sort of answer it methodologically like that. Mm -hmm. I, th I think with an eye on time, there's one more question. Um, um, there's more in the chat, but I think you'll be able to see them um, uh, after the session as well. And this is from Gillian Forrester, one of our speakers from yesterday, which is, um, thank you, um, Leo and John, for excellent papers. But uh, Gillian was also wondering, um, well, it's for you, Leo, but it's probably for both of you, actually, the question of the end of early Turner. What, when is early Turner? Um, yeah. And the review that you cited situates it before 1819. I think Eric Shane's is 1815. I think that's yeah. the date. So, yeah. you know, there are there are competing dates. But do you have a kind of a, uh, what, what would you posit as the early Turner, the end of early Turner? Or would yeah, you I, not wish to? I, no, no, I'm, I'm, I, I, in one sense, yeah, I don't wish to in that, I, you know, I, my point is it, it sort of doesn't exist, uh, but probably actually I do. So, you know, and I'm like thrilled to hear John's attention to um, the 1819 exhibition and uh, the Farnley Hall material, because I do view that exhibition as a kind of, um, rather than necessarily the trip to Italy, right, um, as, a, as a significant moment where um, there's suddenly this, looking back at things and there's suddenly a kind of retrospective glance um, to things and the fact that Turner um, himself made that drawing which was on the catalog for the um, collection which has his images in it um, is I think remarkable so that's kind of what I'm what I'm going to go with there. Yeah I, I think that's that's an interesting point there's a 
William Carey, of course, subsequently writes his account of the 1819 exhibition, describing it really as Turner's great triumph, like, you know, with him as a Roman emperor you know, parading through the rooms as, as if it were his moment of triumph. Mm -hmm. This was the moment where he kind of launched himself and cemented his position. I was going to ask Leah a question about that review of that exhibition you showed, which slightly confused me as to whether or not the reviewer was complimentary about the works that were on, he was showing in that show or not. Um, he seemed to say on one hand, look at these works, they're a sign of his grandeur, and on the other hand, not. Yeah. They're a sign of his decline. So it kind of confused yeah. me a little bit. Yeah, I think that as 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 best I can tell from it, they're really the they're really praising the especially the watercolors from the aughts. Um, and that's really where sort of the kernel of things lies. Um, and yeah, it's interestingly ambivalent over academical works there too. Um, and it's interesting to me that that hesitancy, um, right, which which we've seen continues, was sort of already present um, there. Um, I, I, you know, always wish for more out of those things and wish they'd gone into more detail. But it's my reading that it's really things like the, the 1802 Swiss watercolors that are meant to be well what, what what's sure. interesting as well in, in that line is that exhibition of course includes a number of sketches mm -hmm. and i know that there were critics at the time comment quite a lot on the thrill as it were of seeing these unfinished kind of yeah. work they like yeah. that kind of immediately yeah. the sense that these are not the kinds of works of course that you're you'd ever see in the royal academy yeah well, I, th I think at that point, and clearly with a sense, well, that both there are questions lining up and this conversation could carry on in its own terms as well. But nonetheless, I think in order for the um, day to proceed and for people to have, have a, bit, uh, a bit of a break before the um, next session, I'm going to um, call things to a close there and thank John and Leo for... Um, well, I mean, the quality of the questions, I think, reflects also the, you know, the, the, the quality of, of both papers and, and uh, um, a term which cropped up already. They're kind of generative in pointing ways of thinking afresh about early Turner. And I think about Turner more generally, actually, and uh, and, and how we how we approach the artist. Um, we are due to resume at uh, 10 15. So unless anybody jumps in um, from the organizers to say we will change the timetable, I think we can stick with that. And that's still enough time to to freshen up or uh, put the kettle on. Um, and uh, the panel for uh, curating Turner will start at um, 10 15. So we'll see you back here then. Thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. So good morning um, or afternoon, depending on where in the world you are. I'm delighted um, to welcome you to the fourth panel of the symposium, Curating Turner. My name is Lucinda Lax and I'm curator of paintings and sculpture at the Yale Centre for British Art and I'll be acting as chair um, for the panel. Um, so the panel will consider the relationships between scholarship, curatorship and the presentation of Turner's work in the very different settings of the art gallery and the country house. Um, and in doing so, um, will remind us that art is never displayed in isolation, but always in presentational and interpretive contexts, ones that inevitably inflect the meanings of the artworks for their audiences. Um, so I'm sure it's gonna be a really interesting panel. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce the first of our speakers, Emily Knight. Emily works for the National Trust as property curator um, at Petworth House. She was previously assistant curator of paintings and drawings at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and a postdoctoral fellow and curatorial assistant at Historic Royal Palaces. She has curated a number of exhibitions and displays focused on aspects of 18th and 19th century British art and has published on topics including artist sketchbooks, commemorative portraiture, the history of colour and artists' manuals. Emily completed her doctorate at the University of Oxford in 2019 and has received grants and fellowships from the Yale Centre for British Art, the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art and the Huntington Library. 
As curator at Petworth, Emily is responsible for one of the most important locations in Turner's artistic and personal life. Today, she'll be talking to us about the history and future of the displays of Turner's paintings at Petworth. So without further ado, I will hand over to Emily. Hello, thank you. Um, can you see me okay? I'll just, I'm just gonna share my screen now. Okay, is that working for everyone? That looks good, Emily. I think you just need to put it into presenter mode if you can. Try that again. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Um, thank you for the introduction, Lucinda, and thank you for having me today. I'm delighted to speak for such an esteemed group of speakers. Um, I joined Petworth as property curator almost six months ago, and I've thrown myself into studying its vast collection. This has inevitably led me to tracing the steps of some of my predecessors, poring over past correspondence, exhibition proposals, hangs and layouts throughout the house, amongst much else. Turner has unsurprisingly loomed large in this exploration, and with the anniversary of his birth coming up in 2025, I've been keen to examine his place within the history of Petworth, how and where his work has been displayed, his lingering presence that has permeated so many past curatorial endeavours, and to think about new directions for research, presentation, and interpretation for our visitors. Petworth came into the trust care in 1947, and a significant por portion of its collections on long-term loan for the treasury in 1956. At Petworth, much of the collections were eventually transferred from the treasury to the National Trust, but the 20 Turner paintings were allocated to Tate in 1984 in recognition of their international significance. Over the following decades, the Trust, in close collaboration with Tate, made Turner the focus of several exhibitions and a key figure within major projects at Petworth, which I'll go on to outline later. In this paper, I'm going to look at how these various projects and approaches to Turner relate to contemporary thinking about the artists and the way in which his work was discussed and presented elsewhere. I'll then consider a few future directions for the approach to Turner at Petworth. My paper today is questioning rather than conclusive. What else is there to say? How can we discover more about these paintings and invite our audiences to look at this titan of British art afresh? What role should we play in assessing Turner's prominence both at Petworth and in the histories of British art? Before I go further, I'll begin with a brief introduction to Petworth. It holds perhaps the most significant collection of art at the National Trust with incredibly rich holdings of paintings, sculpture and decorative arts. These collections have come together from the patronage and acquisition of successive generations of the Percy, Seymour and Wyndham families. Among the most significant of the collectors at Petworth was George Wyndham, the third Earl of Egremont, whose main contribution to what we see today was his patronage of contemporary British artists. This period has widely been considered Petworth's golden age because it was during this time that the collection not only grew significantly, but artists like Turner, Chantry, Phillips and Carew stayed at Petworth and participated in a culture of artistic exchange and learning, the legacy of which reverberates throughout Petworth to this day. The collections are vast, as I said, but it's Petworth's history with Turner in particular that has always captured the imagination of its visitors. In Christopher Hussey's first article about Petworth in Country Life, published in November 1925, he opens by saying, that there is a picture of Turner that has caught the peculiar sensation produced by Petworth on the visitor. He describes, oh, is that picture appearing for anyone? No, it's not. Ah, oh. okay, let me just try that again. Sorry about that. There we go. Um, he describes the golden haze of evening and romance and that calm glamour, which seems a permanent element of the Petworth atmosphere. For Hussey, Turner's paintings inspired by and produced at Petworth embodied the very essence of the place. He later described his eventual visit. I sat where Turner had painted, saw the very points of view and lingered in rooms where hung some of the score of scintillating canvases that make Pet the Petworth gallery the equal of any national collection. 
He even goes so far as to say that Lord Egremont, having hitched the chariot of his name to Turner, Constable and Blake, unconsciously achieved a fair chance of immortality. Some 20 years later, um, when Petworth came to the trust in 1947, Hussey published another piece in Country Life. Throughout the article, he discusses the possibility of the collections following suit and focuses primarily on British painting, taking most time to discuss the score of magnificent Turner landscapes and seascapes that give the collection an international significance, anticipating, it seems, later discussions about their ownership. After the trust took, trust took on Petworth, Anthony Blunt was invited by Robin Fedden, then secretary to the trust, to, assist, to assess the physical needs and presentation of the collection. This ultimately resulted in Blunt overseeing the rehanging of the paintings and placing of the sculpture over the subsequent year or so. Up to this point, the paintings by Turner were on display throughout the house in an arrangement that Blunt later described as a haphazard manner. He noted that some of the most important Turners were in rooms that were not going to be open to the public. In the North Gallery, a lodger turned sculpture gallery extended by the third Earl in two stages in the 1820s, purely devoted to displaying his ever-expanding collection. Blunt reduced the number of paintings by half, removing all those in the South Corridor and installing paintings by Turner, Gainsborough, Zoffany, Wilson, de Lutterberg and Witherington into the Central Corridor at a lower register, and above paintings by Fusley, Barry, Leslie and Blake thereby creating a gallery of English painting in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And here are a few shots here. For those of you who don't know Petworth, I've included a plan highlighting where we are. The west front is the, is the front of the house. Um, and if you can see here, we've got um, in the top right-hand photo, um, you can see the Thames near Windsor, Anastiso, and Echo, and the lower register, and in the lower photo, you can see the Egremont C piece paired with the corket on the other side. Blunt made no changes to the carved room, which I'll discuss in a moment. And he doesn't mention this earlier arrangement during the 19th century, which included the four turners we see in that space today. With the benefit of hindsight, Blunt wrote, I realized that I was in the end somewhat ruthless. Despite his efforts to avoid creating a museum atmosphere, his approach was very much in keeping with what one might expect to find at a museum. A carefully selected group telling the story of English painting hung in one or two tiers, cool, modern, to take Michael Hall's words. For Turner, this meant grouping 13 of the paintings in the collection into what was then called the Oak Room, later the Turner Room, and now the Red Room, returning back to its earlier name. Oh, sorry, the same thing's happened again. Don't know why it's doing that. Um, so the remain so the 13 paintings were taken into the red room, which you can see here on the slide now. The remaining turners were hung in the North Gallery, which is immediately next to the red room. In his article, Blunt describes the difficulty he had in finding a successful arrangement in what was to become the Turner Room, crediting the input of Lady Egremont, who later came in and rehung the whole space, also replacing the horrible crimson wall covering with exquisite golden yellow silk. I hope, Blunt wrote, the room will never be touched. The room has indeed been touched and quite significantly as part of a later project, which I'll outline later. And you can see here the difference now, the black and white photos showing it um, after, the, um, uh, after the yellow walls went in and the bottom right uh, shows the room as it is today. The quantity of paintings by Turner in the collection, coupled with his distinction as an artist through these methods of display, indicates his continued significance and esteem with which his work was held during the 1950s, before that swell in scholarship that we've spoken about already in this conference, um, that was in part prompted by the major bicentenary exhibitions of 1974 to 5, as well as the founding of the S Turner Society in 1975, the publication of Butler and Joel's catalogue resume in 1977, the formation of Turner Studies in 86, and the opening of The Claw in 87. When Blunt's reflections on the rehang were later published in National Trust Studies, it was noted that his arrangement had changed little in the last 25 years. Shortly afterwards, the ownership of the, of the Turners transferred from the Treasury to Tate, as I said, in, in recognition of their importance. Three years later, the new Claw Gallery opened at Tate, displaying, was displaying afresh the Turner Bequest. 
which included a room devoted to Petworth and East Cows. Here, the studies of two of the four landscape paintings Turner made for the carved room at Petworth were displayed. Petworth Park, uh, Tillington Church in the distance and Chichester Canal. From this point on, regular meetings were held between the, the Tate and uh, the National Trust, ensuring the long-term care of this aspect of the collection. It's clear why people later objected to Blunt's approach, which in a sense was an earlier embodiment of the curatorial decisions by Tate, a very different kind of environment for viewing, uh, for viewing art. Uh, Petworth, for all its wonderful paintings, is not an art gallery, and the physical context of the space, the relationship between the architecture and the collection, the earlier functions of the rooms, add an essential dimension to questions around display and presentation. Beginning around this time, there was a wave of activity to represent the collections at Petworth, reversing much of Blunt's intervention several decades before. This initially gained momentum thanks to activity on the private side of the house, the Egremonts having hired Alec Cobb to rehang their rooms in 1983. In a recent article um, within the Art in the Country House project um, run by the Paul Mellon Centre, Cobb outlines his methods and displays of the collection room by room, noting that when it came to the White Library, and I think we've seen the, the watercolour on the, on the left a few times here, um, which is a private space in the house, um, only sometimes open to visitors. The paintings were hung in sympathy, he says, with watercolours by Turner. This became the core approach throughout the public rooms, agreed upon by the Trust's art pan arts panel, marrying up Turner's watercolours with the closest in date inventory and records. This method was perhaps most fully realised in the North Gallery. The project, which ran from 91 to 93, was similarly designed to evoke the spirit of the gallery during the Third Earl and Turner's time, once again departing from Blunt's paired back arrangement. Initially, the gallery was painted a white pale grey, confirmed by physical evidence, and this watercolour by Turner, here we are, um, and this portrait by Phillips of the Third Earl, you can see the North Gallery to the right um, in, that, in that painting. The decision was made, however, to adopt the deep red that was probably in the gallery in the 1870s to avoid the bitumen damages condition of so many, bitumen damages, damaged condition of many of the paintings looking like black holes framed shabbily on a light ground. This is the most striking departure from how Turner would have known this space. Here, aesthetics prevailed. And this is uh, the North Gallery in an image recently taken. Um, the eight Turners listed in the gallery in 1835 were returned with the addition of several others, which were then in Egremont House in Grosvenor Place, London. This saw the dismantling of Blunt's Turner room in the adjoining space, an adjoining room, which was similarly returned to its appearance during Turner's time, further prompting a reassessment of the carved room into which Turner's four panoramic landscapes were initially installed. The aim of the carved room project was to return the room to its appearance during the early 19th century, reversing the changes made in the late 19th century by the second Lord Leckenfield. This meant, meant bringing back carvings that had been removed and returning the four landscapes that were created specifically for the room by Turner. The project was celebrated with an exhibition called Turner at Petworth, and we've just heard about the wonderful catalogue that was published at the same time. Um, a high point in over 10 years of work um, Christopher Rowell wrote, wrote to restore the spirit of Turner's Petworth. For the first time, all the paintings associated with the carved room were brought together. The four landscapes returned to the locations for which they were originally intended, shown alongside the six associated paintings produced by Turner as he worked his way towards the final composition. Alongside this major representation project, the National Trust worked with Pallant House on an exhibition called Langlands and Bell at Petworth, Turner Studio Residency Exhibition, which explored the concept of the artist's studio. This coincided with the opening of the old library at Petworth to, the, to visitors for the first time. Traditionally understood to be Turner's studio, actually a space used by many artists. The carved room project reinstated a scheme that the third Earl had created in the 19th century, but the prevailing feel and orange of the, uh, origin of the space is very 17th century, surrounded as you are by the magnificent carvings by Grinling Gibbons, John Selden, and later Jonathan Ritson. Nevertheless, in their co-authored introduction to the catalogue, Fiona Reynolds, then Director General of the National Trust, 
and Nicholas Sarota, then director of Tate, described how the project, above all, had returned four of Turner's most beautiful landscapes to the unusually ornate setting for which they originally intended. And again, here, when we see the carved room um, in some of the um, sort of advertising material that was produced, um, it's very much a, a Turner story. Following these major projects, my predecessor at Petworth, Andy Lauchs, staged three hugely popular exhibitions at Petworth, uh, partly in our dedicated exhibition space and partly in the house. Turner Sussex in 2013, Mr. Turner, an exhibition co-curated with Jacqueline Riding in 2015, and Turner and the Age of British Watercolour in 2017. I'm not going to speak too much about these exhibitions, partly because I think Andy's on the call and could give a much better overview of their successes. But in each instance, nuance and contextualisation was given to Turner at Petworth, both in terms of the subject he depicted and his place within the history of British art. So where does this leave us now? What more is there to learn about Turner and his paintings at Petworth? How should we think about curating Turner to take the title of this session? the future presentation, interpretation and exhibition of his work. As I said at the start, I'm not yet six months into my time at Petworth, and I'm still getting to know the collection. But in my mind, there are some key avenues for future research and engagement. Throughout the literature on Turner at Petworth, references made to the work of previous restorers, some infamous in their professional legacy, including Kennedy Norse, Horace Buttery and John Brealey how these paintings have been treated, the approaches taken, the successes and missteps constitute an important part of their history that merits further research. Rebecca, Helen and I, um, Becca came up in conversation in um, Joyce's paper, <coughs> is the Senior National Conservator of Paintings at the National Trust and previously Paintings Conservator at Tate. Um, together we've started to think about the treatment of Turner's of the Turners at Petworth as a case study in a broader history about conservation and restoration in the 20th century, with of course particular reference to the houses in the trust, including Petworth. Relatedly, there may be opportunities to further Becker's research into Turner's methods for finishing paintings. In her article, Three Days or More, published in the British Art Journal in 2014, Becker discusses the degree of mythology surrounding Turner's varnishing day practice at the Royal Academy outlining the camaraderie between artists and questioning the level of staging that went on to balance and situate the paintings in their temporary setting. While the third Earl preferred to buy work directly from Turner than at the Royal Academy, it may be enlightening to explore what remains of the original surfaces of the Turners at Petworth. Did he adopt a similar site-specific approach to the presentation of his paintings when he was commissioned to paint landscapes for a particular location? such as, we can see in this image, his four paintings in the carved room. What physical evidence might there be for that? Can we jointly revive our programmes of technical examination and revisit the potential of aesthetic treatments? What might a comparison between these four paintings and his sketches now at Tate reveal about his methods? And what of some of the earlier paintings, where varnishes are now discoloured to the extent that cool tones and depths of field are lost? I'd also like to think more about Turner's place within the social networks of Petworth during the early 19th century. Little, if any, scholarship on Turner's time at Petworth fails to mention the quantity of artists who studied, who stayed there, studying the collections and producing their own work. There are endless anecdotes that illuminate the social and sometimes playful relationships between these artists, such as Chantry supposedly mimicking footsteps or knock of the third earl in order to gain access to Turner's very private studio. But what do these relationships really mean to Turner's professional life? Did they translate into projects, commissions and partnerships beyond Petworth? Is there evidence of artistic exchange that we can examine more closely? Can we reach a better understanding about the social life of these artists thanks to the generosity of their collective patron? These artistic relationships were, of course, one feature of the social life of Petworth. It's important not to forget what a busy and multifaceted place it was during this period as much a place for business and sport as it was for art. This is well documented by Turner in his numerous depictions of day-to-day -day life within the house. We have these intimate drawings of the interiors of Petworth that Turner made, but how did he operate in this setting? Is there more we can discover about him by looking at his relationships, not just with other artists in the third Earl, but with his patrons, family and visiting friends? 
In this paper, I've outlined how, from the time Pet West came to the Trust, numerous representation, conservation and exhibition projects have thrust Turner into the spotlight over and over again. But this is also the home to numerous portraits by Van Dyck, rare paintings on oil by, um, rare paintings on copper by Elsheimer, and others by Titian, Claude, Reynolds, Kaufman, excuse me, my voice is going to say, alongside outstanding examples of ancient neoclassical sculpture, not to mention prime examples of furniture by Boulle and um, important ceramics. And yet for many, just like Christopher Hussey, it's impossible to experience Petworth without doing so through Turner's eyes. The evocative power of his watercolours at Tate seem to hover in front of Petworth, a filter that colours our understanding and appreciation of it. The overarching curatorial approach to show Petworth that Turner would have known it has surely only enhanced this feeling for many. In Susan Owens' new book, Spirit of Place, she talks about approaching a sweeping view of Dead and Vale, unable to separate her experience of the place with her knowledge of Constable. These are the filters through which the landscapes appear to be, she writes. My challenge at Petworth is to find new ways of harnessing this interest in Turner, while enhancing both our scholarly understanding of his work and our visitors' engagement with it, as well as positioning the paintings by Turner in the broader historical and collections context. The setting of these paintings is essential to our understanding of them, but it's important not just to swim in the pool of inspiration, both in terms of the landscape collections and interior spaces, but to examine more closely the networks and interactions within which he operated during Petworth's so-called golden age, and as discussed, to better understand how Turner painted his famous works still on display today. These are initial thoughts that I look forward to shaping in the lead up to the anniversary in 2025. It's been wonderful to hear from other colleagues about their current research, and there are clear intersections with some of the ideas I've discussed. Um, and I hope these are conversations that we can continue to have as you all try to come a little closer to understanding Turner. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. That was a, a really fascinating paper um, and just gave us such a, a vivid snapshot into the intricacies of displaying Turner works and indeed other artworks in such a, a rich um, historical context. So thank you. Um, and just before I introduce our next speaker, just a quick reminder to everybody to put any questions into the Q&A and we can then um, come back to them at the end of the panel. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Helen Cobby. Helen recently took up the position of lecturer, collections and material culture at Bath Spa University in the UK. Prior to this, Helen spent almost six years as assistant curator at the Barber Institute of Fine Arts at the University of Birmingham, where she had special responsibility for the displays of prints and drawings. She also led many of the Barber's decolonization strategies and co-curated exhibitions on modernity and internationalism in mid-century Cornwall and on the Scottish colorists. She completed her master's degree at University College London, specialising in Rodin's sculpture and photography. Today, she's going to tell us about the touring exhibition of Turner's early prints and drawings that she curated at the Ashmolean Museum in 2016. So I'm delighted to hand over to Helen. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'll start by sharing my screen. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that now. Um, so thank you very much. Um, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this symposium. It's great to be here. During this paper, I'll discuss and critique aspects of the Young Turner touring exhibition that I curated in 2016 while working at the Ashmolean Museum, part of the University of Oxford. This was an invaluable experience for many reasons, not least because it enabled me to experience the impact and potential of presenting aspects of Turner's early work in regional galleries and museums. This paper suggests that taking such angles, which revolve around notions of the emerging artist and materiality, and a place based in their approach, may help refresh exhibitions about Turner and contribute perhaps to certain gaps in the literature 
and public facing presentations of the artist. In particular, this could help position more centrally considerations around visitor experience, visitor expectations and curatorial responsibilities in exhibition making moving forwards. We can see the next slide. Is that coming up for anyone? No, we can't yet see that, Helen. Um, sorry about that. I'm just trying to change my... Oh. Ah. Is that? Yeah, there we go, that's perfect. Great, thank you. The Young Turner exhibition presented some of Turner's first commissions and contemporaneously celebrated topographical works. It focused on his drawings, watercolours and engravings from the 1780s to the 1810s, which exemplify his interest and expertise in architecture, his growing knowledge of perspective and sources of his early inspiration the people, art and places. The artworks were primarily from the Ashmolean's own collection and were complemented by 12 loans from the Tate. Among these high profile loans were Turner's first known sketchbook from about 1789, two drawings of Oxford's High Street and some of his large scale, rarely exhibited diagrams that he made in around 1810 for the lectures he gave at the Royal Academy during his tenure as professor of perspective. Turner's oil painting entitled A View of the High Street, Oxford, made between 1809 and 1810, was the centrepiece of the exhibition. It is a unique pinnacle in Turner's early output and has commissioned a topographical painting used as designs for engravings. It is also unusual being the only oil painting that he made for such a commission. His previous and future designs were executed in watercolor at the time of organising the exhibition, the painting was a major new acquisition at the Ashmolean. It had been on loan to the museum from a private collection since 1997, until in 2015, it was offered to the nation in lieu of inheritance tax. You may remember the Ashmolean's campaign to raise 10% of the required funds. The rest was generously supplied by the Heritage Lottery Fund, the Art Fund, and the Ashmolean's friends and patrons and private donors. The HLF also stipulated that, hopefully once acquired, the painting should be celebrated and shared with as wide an audience as possible, and provided the funds for an exhibition to help make this possible. This was an exciting challenge and a lot to get my teeth into. The HLF brief and support was perfect for enabling me to fulfill the responsibility I feel as a curator to decentralize major artists from major cities and art hubs and instead ensure their work reaches a wider variety of areas in the UK. On this slide, you can see a page from the visitor book at Worcester City Art Gallery and Museum, which was one of the tour venues. It is typical of a lot of visitor feedback we received with people repeatedly saying it was good to have the exhibition, and I quote, out here in Worcestershire and in the other local towns that were part of the tour. I decided to try and shape the project as a whole to provide context to the painting and explore how informative Turner's early years can be in refreshing or rethinking ideas about the artist. Drawing from his initial training as an architectural draftsman, I wanted to show how Turner was concerned with depicting specific places with accuracy and yet also layers of emotion, connection and informed memory. I was keen not to prioritise through the selection of works and the interpretation, the sense of intangible atmosphere, light and overall abstract qualities of the place, which can often be emphasised in exhibitions, especially those that tend to focus on his later years. There is a history of the artist's early work being largely disregarded, and they are still less widely known by the public today. 
Ruskin was one of the first to treat Turner's early work in this way. For example, by advising his father not to purchase Oxford's, Turner's Oxford watercolours made prior to the 1820s. A lot of visitor feedback also commented on how the Young Turner exhibition revealed a different side to the artist. With one visitor writing, I discovered that Turner did indeed paint not just seascapes, while another said, a different take on Turner, having lived in Oxford, I really appreciated it. There were four venues participating in the Young Turner tour. It opened in the spring of 2018 at the Cecil Higgins Art Gallery and Museum in Bedford. They reported that they'd enjoyed their busiest May since 2012 because of the exhibition. It then toured to Blenheim Palace in Woodstock, which saw the highest number of visitors, with over 63,000 paying visitors and over 9,000 non-paying visitors. This was followed by Worcester City Art Gallery and Museum, and finally, into the first few months of 2020, Banbury Museum. I chose these venues on the basis of the relevance of their collections and or geographical locations to the exhibition's narrative, as well as the dialogue that we had about the exhibition and the potential opportunities the venues felt it had for their audiences. Where appropriate, the venues showcased local topographical views or works by Turner and his contemporaries from their own collections. This helped tailor the exhibition to each place and to some extent allow it to evolve throughout the tour. For example, the Higgins has nine watercolours by Turner, an artist who inspired him, such as Edward Days and Thomas Girton. Blenheim Palace was also a highly relevant host because the frame maker and later print dealer and mayor of Oxford, James Wyatt, who commissioned the painting View of the High Street, Oxford, was also the curator of the fourth Duke of Marlborough's paintings at the palace. Oxford, however, remained the central focus of the exhibition. This was helpful for focusing an otherwise potentially wide ranging show. It's hard to keep pace with such a prolific artist after all. And crucially for raising awareness of the often overlooked fact that during the first 15 years of Turner's career, he painted over 30 finished watercolors at Oxford. This was the most numerous group in his oeuvre devoted to a single place in Venice. This focus provided dialogue with, as well as distance to, a previous major exhibition held at the Ashmolean in 2000, which looked at Turner's engagement with Oxford through his entire career. It was curated by, by Colin Harrison, senior curator of European art at the Ashmolean, and my line manager at the time. There have been other in-depth explorations of Turner's Oxford, most extensively by Patrick Youngblood, in 1984, and a concise summary by Andrew Kennedy in 2001, but both are from a considerable time ago now. Why Oxford? Due to lack or loss of documentation, it is still not possible to be certain of Turner's attraction to the city. Hopefully the exhibition was clear that some questions like this were raised and couldn't be answered, as it should be, I think, with exhibition making. After all, there are things we don't know even about the most famous of artists. However, we can try to build up wider pictures and explore possibilities. During the period covered by the exhibition, 53 views of Oxford and Cambridge were exhibited at the Royal Academy by artists including Edward Days and Thomas Mountain Younger, who, according to Walter Thornbury, Turner described as being his real master. Oxford evidently had a large popular appeal. Perhaps Turner was in part drawn to the city to develop his reputation and create saleable work. He had also been familiar with Oxfordshire since childhood from visiting relatives in Sunningwell, where he sketched his first views of the city and individual buildings in his early surviving sketchbook, a page from which is showing on this slide. Above all, perhaps his interest in and knowledge of architecture surely made the city an obvious choice, and one that went far deeper than any business-minded decision to cater tourist taste. Perhaps Turner was also particularly fond of Oxford as it was here that his career was significantly advanced when the trustees of the Oxford University Press commissioned him to create watercolours to be translated 
into engravings by James Bazir for the Oxford Almanac. With this wide, this is the widely collected annual single sheet calendar, which has been published by the University Press since 1674. The project was Turner's first grand scale commission for which he created 10 watercolors between 1799 and 1804. It marked the first time that he was able to establish a close relationship with an engraver and one held in such high regard. This may have also been particularly satisfying on a personal level as Turner's first known Oxford view from 1787 is a copy of Edward Rooker's engraving after Michael Rooker's design for the Oxford Almanac shown on this slide. Turner's Almanac watercolours and prints were a main focus of the Young Turner exhibition. Their inclusion was exciting partly because they had rarely been exhibited or discussed before. They also helped the exhibition narrative to be process-led rather than purely artist-led for example, by focusing on the links between and qualities of the watercolours and engravings and exposing the highly collaborative process of engraving and the creativity and skill required for translating paintings into prints. Different states of the prints were displayed, such as an early state of Brazenow College on the screen here. This gave insights not only into how the engraver built up the images by first introducing architectural details and how he moved between different quality of line and shading, but how he was entrusted at times by Turner to fill in gaps and to add new details. Some of the watercolours, for example, of Christchurch are in poor condition. Instead of shying away from displaying these, as is sometimes the case in exhibitions, their inclusion, signed off of course by the Ashmolean Paper Conservator, helped reveal that these watercolours were originally considered working documents. I was keen that this contributed to challenging a commonly perceived hierarchy between these mediums. A significant proportion of the exhibition visitors had not encountered this turning of tables before, nor seen poor condition turners prior to the show. This combination seemed to draw people closer to the artist and his working practice, breaking down some of the all too familiar boundaries around a genius artist. Exhibiting a view from inside of Brazenose College was also key for illustrating some of the artist's networks that made the images possible in the first place. For instance, Turner was the first artist to depict interior scenes for the university calendar which suggests his privileged access to university buildings. He knew one of the trustees, Dean of Christchurch, as well as one of the Christchurch fellows, Cyril Jackson, amongst others, as well, of course, as artists like Edward Days, who may have encouraged the commission and also helped provide access in the first place. Turner's depictions of these Oxford colleges needed to be further contextualized in the exhibition. I chose to focus on his initial training and work as an architectural draftsman, including to Thomas Hardwick, Thomas Moulton Younger and James Wyatt, of course, not the print selling Wyatt of Oxford. This side to Turner rarely seems to be discussed publicly and yet his skills not only paved the way for his later successes, but were highly regarded by architects and he was often commissioned to prepare architectural perspective drawings in his early days. For example, a perspective view of Font Hill Abbey in Wiltshire, the Gothic house built for William Beckford, made by Turner in about 1798, was exhibited at the RA under the name of its architect, James Wyatt. This is now in the collection of the Yale Centre for British Art. Furthermore, Turner references his training in his perspective lectures and accompanying diagrams, which he delivered as part of his role as Professor of Perspective at the RA, a post he held for 30 years from 1807. The lectures, now mostly in the British Library, are still yet to be transcribed and edited, with the exception of one I think commonly referred to as Background's Introduction of Architecture and Landscape. Roger Fry once wrote that it would be unfair to Turner to publish work which only shows his weaknesses. However, in contemporary exhibitions and publications, 
it could be considered the duty of a curator to expose such a side to such a famous artist and to explore what can be said or learned from such weaknesses. This can also surely allow room for much needed discussions around who gets to decide on the value of works and archival material today, who gets to select, to select and speak for them and in what way. The lectures are fairly difficult to get a hold on, partly because Turner rewrote and reordered them over the course of his professorship, much like he referred back to early drawings to rethink or reimagine compositions. I had just le less than six months on this project, but one of the things I wish I'd been able to do, as can often be the case for curators, was to spend more time with primary sources, including Turner's lectures. Further in investigations could, for example, help to map the possible influences of certain works on the rewriting of the lectures, as well as add to wider research into the relationships between Turner's writing and visual art. Turner made about 180 diagrams for his lectures. They vary from boldly annotated line drawings, mostly done freehand using red and black watercolour over pencil, to detailed watercolours, and some even credit the ideas of both the younger and elder Thomas Mountain. Examples of both types were included in the Young Turner exhibition and were picked out as particular highlights by both visitors and press. Most previous exhibitions that include Turner's diagrams, I think have been held at or organized by the Tate and date from 1980 to 2009, with one of the most quoted being Turner as Professor, the Artist and Linear Perspective, curated by Morris Davis at the Tate in 1992. With its publication, it concentrated on the lectures given in 1811 and it explored how Turner's how Turner critiqued and manipulated perspective in his own art. In the words of the curator, how he dismantled old theories and constructed new ones. Turner started to give his lectures the year he finished the Ashmolean's painting, View of the High Street, Oxford, and the print made artist's painting a few years later included his title as Professor of Perspective to the Royal Academy. This suggests he was proud of the title and drew connections between his teaching and his art. However, as far as I can see, the oil painting View of the High Street, Oxford, and the lectures haven't been connected up in literature or exhibitions before. Did this commission help to give him the confidence to start lecturing four years into his professorship? And did his work as professor of perspective pave the way for his accomplishments with this painting? The Young Turner exhibition made preliminary links, but there is more to be done. And there's only so much that can be included on exhibition labels or on the slim accompanying publication we created, which due to budget, wasn't able to include works from the Tate. To conclude, I learned a lot from the exhibition of curating this show. I'm not going to list them all, but a few takeaways were discovering firsthand how visitors like knowing about the personal connections between an artist and a particular place or person, and the appeal of everyday networks for bringing historic works and artists closer to the present day. Although curators often seem to be intrigued by artists' late periods and may feel that this is what their visitors want, it's always worth considering the earlier years. It's not a bad thing to make audiences feel surprised or even to encourage them to step out even uncomfortably into relatively unknown, uncharted territory. There are many things I would do differently now, about seven years on, even though it is outside of the central focus of the exhibition, I would ensure that interpretations of Oxford architecture include a decolonial approach, for example, by acknowledging problematic statues and associated historic people of certain colleges. I would also further trace the labyrinth people and places that Turner was or may have been connected to, particularly the Oxford print seller James Wyatt. His commission of View of the High Street Oxford is, after all, the most well documented of all Turner's commissions. A main legacy of the exhibition could, in an ideal world, have been to make publicly available 
turn as letters to wines. But exhibitions can't do everything and no one wants to read an essay on a gallery wall. Perhaps though, they could do more to link to other people's research and exhibitions within their spaces, pose more questions, invite more discussion and feedback, be more multi-dimensional, open, collaborative and breathable, and perhaps above all, acknowledge their own impermanence, but also their power. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, that was another really fascinating um, paper and I just really enjoyed um, hearing you talking about um, uh, Turner's relationship um, with, with Oxford and, and how you played that through in, in, in those um, exhibitions. So thank you so much. Um, we have some um, interesting questions. So um, I think we have just around about 10 minutes um, for questions before we break. Um, so a really interesting one has come in from um, Julia Webb Harvey. Thank you, Julia. Um, this is this is really interesting. And I think actually um, both uh, you and Emily, um, uh, I, I would like to, it would be great to hear you speak, uh, both of you to this question. So I'm just going to read it out. Um, so Amy, um, that's Ken Cannon, said yesterday that there was a Turner for everyone, which chimed for me with something that Simon Sharma said during a, a 2006 documentary, um, which was shown on the BBC called Power of Art. Um, he said something along the lines, everyone thinks they know Turner. He's as comfortably British as a cup of tea. Um, but what he wanted to share was his Turner, the Cockney poet just short of madness. Um, that's uh, in quotes. I'm really interested in how you chose how Turner is portrayed, not just in, in the art, but who he was when you curate an exhibition. Uh, so that's a great question. I, I wonder if um, uh, perhaps, um, Emily, you, you could start um, and, and, um, and, and, and uh, just answer that if, if possible. Sure. Um, so I seem to be having a bit of trouble with my camera. Um, but yeah, it'll just be my voice, I think. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. And I think one of the things that obviously is quite specific to a place like Petworth, where for a number of our visitors, they are coming to see the collection of Turner, is how you present a kind of overarching story um, that is kind of well known to most of the people on this call today, um, alongside saying something new and something fresh. And I think that's part of why I've been looking back at all of these approaches and all these different projects um, to see what kind of turn or what aspect of his career people have focused on before. Um, and that's the challenge really. It's both giving the kind of pet with story on the one hand, but also adding something to what we know already. Um, whereas I think if you're doing it in um, a museum or gallery, setting I mean take perhaps aside um you know you can you can sort of choose anything unencumbered in a way um so I think within within the country house setting yeah it's something about that that balance that you have to decide and um yeah be both you know give your, your sort of um visitor who may not know a huge amount of time or what they want but also say something new Great. And, and Helen, I wonder if, if you have any thoughts on that question. Yeah, it's an interesting question and it's definitely a challenge in every exhibition how to portray an artist and balance what we know, what people think they know with the works themselves. I think it's always good to be led by the works um, and not to make assumptions. So that can help draw out perhaps new angles, but also make sure that it's definitely the works that are speaking rather than someone's perspective on the artist or trying to go into personal readings or interpretations or assume that we can know an artist kind of personally. Um, it's also needing to be sensitive to previous exhibitions um, and not sort of regurgitate what's already been, but also not to try and reinvent the wheel for the sake of it either. But there is, I think, a responsibility to give some background to the artist rather than just expecting that everyone will know exactly what you're talking about, or particularly if you're taking a thin sliver of some years um, from an artist's life, it's quite, it can potentially be quite niche and alienating for some people. 
Thank you. Um, very interesting. Um, and I, um, I just had a, a question for both of you, um, slightly, slightly different for you, Helen, but I was just thinking, because um, it's such, such a kind of fascinating glimpse into kind of what spaces do for art. You know that relationship that's created be between certain architecture, certain contexts. Um, and so, firstly, I, I wondered, Emily, because um, you spoke so kind of lucidly and, and, and um, interestingly about um, Anthony Blunt and his approach um, to transforming the galleries at Petworth and how he made them into this kind of public gallery in the in the middle of the Sussex countryside. Um, and then obviously how those approaches have, have, you know, your approach today has has shifted back to thinking about the house as a as a domestic setting and, and how that then um, kind of feeds into how the, the art is displayed. So I wonder um, perhaps if you could a little bit more um, domestic context and actually whether that makes um, the painting more or less access. Um, and similarly um, Helen perhaps if you could uh, follow on from Emily um, I'd be really interested to hear um, your experiences actually you had these four venues that you were working with whether you encountered any challenges between you know adapting or shaping that body of material that you were displaying in each of those four uh, spaces and just as a kind of add-on to that um, obviously, you know, fascinating to be thinking about um, Turner's um, activities, not just as a practitioner, but as a theorist. Um, and you mentioned um, that you hadn't really had a chance to engage with, you know, with some of that primary material. And that is one of the, you know, biggest challenges as a curator. But I wonder um, if you could um, perhaps shed any light on... Um, whether you feel that actually if you had included more of that material um, about um, Turner's role at the RA, his lectures, would that, how, how would you have made that, um, I get, again, you know, accessible or illuminating to visitors? Um, or would that have just kind of added an, another layer of, of complexity to these already, uh, you know, multi-layered um, and difficult uh, and at times challenging images so um I, I yeah I, I'd love to hear you speak to that too if possible um sorry Lucy, you slightly cut out in the first bit but I think you're talking about the difference in approach between Blunt and today yes sorry I didn't yeah. realize I cut out yes uh, please Emily that that would be great sure um so I think yeah the, the key one of the key differences is that with Blunt's more kind of distilled museum but I don't want to say museum like approach like it's a or is it a still thing, but just um yeah, his his approach, part of the issue was that it really significantly reduced, reduced the number of uh, objects that were on display. And so when Alec Cobb writes about his initial work at Petworth, he describes um going into some of the bedrooms, which is just stacked with painting after painting after painting. Um, so part of the approach is not just to return the North Gallery, which has a longer history, but is essentially a very 19th century part of the house into more like, a, you know, how it looked in the 19th century, but also just making available the collections. Um, and so I think, yeah, there's that sense that you still get a story of, of British art. Um, in a way in the room but it's not done in such a considered way where uh, full use isn't made of the environment that it's in because uh, I was sort of conscious reading today that I say it's not a gallery then I kept on referring to it as a gallery and it kind of is and it isn't um, it's not a public gallery um, it, you know very much a private one but somewhere where people as I mentioned artists came to look and to study um, so today in the presentation, you do get that kind of story, but you get more of a sense of how the space looked, how Turner sat with other bits of the collection. Um, and there's just a lot more of it, which I think is always important for visitors that they get, um, you know, a good understanding of, of what's here, what constitutes the collection at Petworth, the kind of things that the Serdal was collecting, what his interests were. Um, so yeah, I think, I hope that's an answer to your question, but as I say, sorry, I, I sort of missed, I missed some of the detail there. Yeah, sorry, I 
think I think the um, I can hear some of the um, speaking coming in and out. So I'm yeah. Um, but that that's great, Emily. Thank you so much. And Helen, I, I wondered if you had um, some thoughts to add to. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, there were lots of challenges of displaying um, the exhibition at four different places. It was also an amazing opportunity to work with all these different regional collections and different audiences and get to know them too in the time. So the venues were different sizes, some were more modern, some more traditional gallery spaces, some were free to access, some were paid um, entry. So there was a lot to juggle with the exhibition. And we did have slightly two different versions of the tour that went to each venue. Um, again, that was partly then needing to sort of manage visitor expectations that they would see most, but not all of the works in each place, but hopefully it encouraged people perhaps to move around and see the same show in different venues and see how it could evolve and adapt to the local place in which it was in. So that was a way of helping to tease out different stories and be very sensitive to different places and visitors, I think. Um, and then the second part of your question, if I caught that correctly, was about the primary material, how to make some of the, um, yeah, complex, complicated um, ideas of the perspective lectures, for example, accessible or present within um, a gallery space. And I think, yeah, I would have loved to have grappled with that more. And I don't think I necessarily have the answer for that, but I think when approaching an exhibition and all the different layers of research that need to be kind of folded into it, it's always thinking about interpretation in a layered approach. So thinking about what could be done with learning and engagement, for example, in accompanying publications, as well as perhaps including like direct quotations by an artist on additional gallery labels or within the main label. I think trying to hear directly from an artist, if we have that, um, a lot of visitors do find that quite compelling. So that could have been one way of interweaving snippets into that show. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm just looking, we have we have a couple more questions. We have a few minutes left. So I'm gonna just dive into these. Um, so an interesting question from Gillian um, Forrester, one of our speakers from yesterday. Thank you, Gillian. Um, so this is for you, Helen. Um, so um, she's, she thanks you for your talk. And she just says, this was a great example of the way in which exhibitions can be both scholarly and accessible to non-specialist audiences and accessible by dint of the exhibition's travel um, schedule. My specific point, you mentioned the extensive correspondence between Turner and Wyatt regarding the engraving, which is indeed fascinating. And it's maybe worth mentioning here that Turner's correspondence, fragmentary as it is, though brilliantly edited by John Gage, is a very important category of Turner literature. And then she asks, how do we showcase it in an exhibition apart from the usual wall text? So that's a challenging question. That is. Well, thank you very much for that feedback as well. That's really nice to hear. And it's always good to learn from um, yeah, scholars in the field. So thank you. I think that is a challenging um, question and maybe links to your previous one as well. How do you get these things physically into spaces? Um, and not just rely on wall texts, which definitely can't do everything um, and need to be very sensitive, I think, to individual works or the themes within the exhibition rather than trying to add too many layers um, in one go. So I think, yeah, the idea perhaps that it's fairly sort of fragmentary correspondence perhaps throws up some quite creative ways of being able to take snippets from it rather than thinking everything has to be kind of physically within a space. Um, one of the things at the Ashmolean which we did try and weave in um, with the learning and engagement was some sort of digital technology within the space. So using iPads, using sound as well, um, and also kind of interactive views, for example, of the High Street in Oxford now, where you could then click in and learn more either through um, act as sort of reading snippets of historic text or through photos and artistic responses today. So perhaps having it layered within some of this digital technology within an exhibition could be one way forward. I'm not sure if that's quite answered the question, but I'll, I'll go away and think more about that. Thank you. 
Yeah, it was a very complicated question. And just very, very quickly, because we are pretty much at time, but there is one um, question here for Emily. Um, so um, Sarah, um, Sarah Leonard from, um, from our panel has asked, um, are there interpretive efforts at Petworth to connect the works to the history of the estate's landscape? That's a good question. Um, in brief, yes. <laughs> um, each year at Petworth, we have kind of annual programming theme and for 25, it's going to be on landscape. Um, so we've been thinking quite a lot about how to enhance that connect connection between the interiors and the, and the sort of views beyond. So for those of you who haven't, who haven't been to Petworth, the carved room um, where we see those four landscape paintings, um, the idea was that you could you know, half, if you were sitting in there for dinner, this was one of the many spaces used for dining. You could look at eye level when seated at uh, the landscape designed by Capability Brown through the windows on one side, and then turn to look at Turner's interpretation of that landscape on the other. And so it's this very immediate connection that we definitely want to enhance um, on a sort of practical level, we are finally getting Wi-Fi installed, so that will open up all sorts of possibilities there. But also not just thinking about how the house um, connects the landscape outdoors, but also the same in reverse. Um, and again, I think it's always uh, an important part of what we do to think about um, bringing visitors who might not necessarily come for the house and the art into it and drawing them in. And I think the fact that we've got this incredibly immediate connection between the two is something that's really um quite rare and and important so yes that's all very much in train so do come in 25 you can see what we've done thank thank you so much emily so i'm going to draw this um panel to a close and i once again want to thank our speakers for their really rich um and illuminating papers we're now going to take a break i think we reconvene at 11 25 for the last of our panels which going to be chaired by Tim Barringer so we'll see you shortly hello everyone and welcome back from the break um I think it says a lot about Turner that after almost eight hours uh, there's still more to be said and uh, it's been an extraordinary conference so far and um, I'm Tim Barringer I'm here to introduce the final session uh, which I think brings to the fore some of the key discourses uh, with which Turner engaged and which have already emerged as important themes uh, in recent scholarship and through the papers we've heard over the last two days. Those themes are ecology, economy and language. Um, the speakers in this panel come from uh, France and from Canada, so semi-francophone, um, uh, and I think this indicates the international importance of Turner's work, both in his own time and uh, in ours, and I'm sure Turner himself would appreciate the transmanche uh, conversation that we're just about to have, or to, to have since he uh, travelled south uh, whenever circumstances allowed. So uh, to introduce our first uh, speaker for this session, uh, Sarah Gould. She is an assistant professor at uh, Université Paris, uh, the Panthéon Sorbonne, where she is, uh, where she focuses on the study of British art, both in her research and in her teaching. Her academic interests lie primarily in the material and ecological meanings of art, and she's published very important work uh, in that uh, regard. Um, and interesting news in her biography is that she's currently finishing a monograph on Jean Everett Millet for the French publishing house Cohen and Cohen. Um, and her title today, which resonates with a lot of what we've heard um, throughout the conference, is The Ecological Turn, brackets, er. So I'd like to hand over to Sarah. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, can you hear me clearly? We can hear you, yes. And we can see your slides. All right. So um, I'd like to start by expressing my appreciation to the conference organizers. My presentation seeks to offer a historiographical overview of environmental, ecological, and ecocritical interpretation of Turner's work. It largely draws on the literature and contributions of scholars and curators, including those presenting at this conference. 
As suggested by the pun in my title, I'll endeavor to identify and explore evolutions, turns and returns within ecological perspectives of Turner's oeuvre. Last June, a highly mediatized study became the headlines of newspapers and magazines when two climate scientists unveiled what was made out to appear as a groundbreaking revelation. In their latest discovery, Anna Lee Albright from Sorbonne University and Peter Hubers from Harvard University proved the profound influence of 19th century air pollution on Turner's and Monet's creative processes. Their research brought to light how stylistic changes in the painter's works, characterized by hazier contours and a predominantly whiter color palette, aligned seamlessly with the optical effects from heightened atmospheric aerosol concentrations. In doing so, the researchers scientifically, uh, scientifically demonstrated how Turner's paintings effectively captured the elements of the atmospheric environmental transformation that unfolded during the Industrial Revolution. The study followed another significant endeavor in uh, 2014 when scientists at the National Observatory of Athens looked for evidence of natural pollution resulting from volcanic eruptions around the globe in the, world, in the work of old masters. Applying the principles of atmospheric physics that describe the impact of aerosols on various wavelengths of solar light, they scrutinized the ratios of red and green use in landscape paintings, particularly focusing on sunsets. Their findings revealed that post-eruption years, often characterized by dirtier skies infused with aerosols, paintings exhibited more pronounced red use in their sunsets. Here again, Turner, whose works represented 108 out of 124 paintings under scrutiny, was established as the cornerstone case study of the experiment. It's worth contemplating the widespread appeal of these demonstrations where Turner stands as the central painter under study. This underscores his contemporary status as paradig paradigmatic artist of the Anthropocene. Yet, while the scientific hypotheses and demonstrations are persuasive, they however reiterate an interpretation of Turner's works that art historians have long acknowledged. In this presentation, I'll endeavor to explore the various angles from which Turner's appreciation of what Andreas Malm calls fossil capital have been approached to then try to illuminate the potential avenues of inquiry such approaches present for future Turner studies. Andrew Patrizio's perspective on the year 1972 as an ecological subject in British art sheds light on a year that coincidentally also witnessed the publication of two significant texts on Turner's response to the rise of steam power a short essay by John Berger, and a book by John Gage. Notably, it was the same year that witnessed the arrival of the slave, sh of the slave ship in America, as Tim Barringer reminded us yesterday. As Patrizio puts it, while 1972 is not typically considered a significant year in art history, an ecological lens reveals its unique position as convergence between two critical moments the growing awareness of the environmental damage caused by human activities and the emergence of deep time studies. That year was also the year of NASA's iconic blue marble photograph that you can see here and of an emblematic round table of the International Council of Museums, which gave rise to green curating initi initiatives. These notable events and initiatives attest to a temporal alignment, which suggests a synchronicity between the ecological awakening and the reevaluation of historical artistic perspectives, in our case, on Turner. In 1972, the same year as his influential ways of seeing, Berger penned an essay on Turner in which he drew an evocative analogy between Turner's art and the sensory experience of his father's barbershop 
invoking the visceral violence of his elemental upbringing composed of, I quote, water, froth, steam, gleaming metal, clouded mirrors, white balls or basins in which soapy liquid is agitated by the barber's brush and detritus deposited. This early immersion in a fusion of organic and hygienic substances, a blend of nature and culture, granted the artist an initial primal encounter with the merging of blood and steam. According to Berger, these elements became indelibly associated in Turner's psyche and by extension in his artistic practice. Berger's words resonate, I quote, Turner lived through the first apocalyptic phase of the British Industrial Revolution. Steam signified more than what filled a barber's shop. Vermilion meant not only furnaces, but also blood. Here, Turner's art becomes a canvas for cultural and, psych and even psychoanalytical readings, reflecting the profound impact of his social class on his, his perception of the Industrial Revolution. Coincidentally, in 1972, John Gage published a cultural analysis of Turner's Rain, Steam and Speed, calling it an allegory of the forces of nature and interpreting the train as a testament to Turner's sympathy for technical innovations such as the steam train. Uh, while Berger and Gage's reading differed from each other, they collectively challenged the modernist interpretation of Turner prevalent in the 1960s, which saw his work as purely focused on effect and form, as exemplified by uh, Lawrence Gowing's work. They also paved the way for social art historians to explore the social and economic power relations embedded in Turner's work. Turner's enduring fascination with steam, with, which served as a powerful symbol of both captivating progress and potentially destructive modernity, has ever since posed an intriguing paradox for scholars. In the catalogue for Turner's modern world, the question arises, I quote, were his pictures of social and technological change elegies for a vanishing past or celebrations of the new or both? Yet within Gage's and Berger's perspectives, a conscious recognition, recognition emerges, an awareness that Turner inhabited a profoundly transformative era. An ecological approach reveals that neither scrutinizing Turner's portrayal of steam as a symbol of progress, nor equating it with violence and destruction suffices. Climate historians have shown that at the time, the perception of air was inherently ambivalent. While concerns with air quality had been long-standing in Turner's time, carbon-filled air was more generally perceived as beneficial, and until the end of the 19th century, there was a prevalent ambivalence towards atmospheric pollution, which was perceived as both a sign of affluence and warmth. Moreover, sulfur dioxide was praised for its deodorizing properties and air cleaning qualities. Sarah, if I am so sorry to interrupt. We are having trouble with your display. So I'm going to try to share your PowerPoint from my computer. Oh. Um, your display is coming up very, very small for us. Um, small. Okay. Is it because maybe it's, is it better like that? It's a little bit better. It's still... Okay, it's now legible enough that we can actually see your captions and everything. Um, uh, wait, okay, okay. Um, I'm sorry. also, like I said, I'm happy to share it from my screen and then you can just tell me next, next. Um, but it is, it's more legible now if you want to go on. Uh, yeah, but uh, I have to, uh, sorry, I have to stop sharing because I can't see my um, text if I do that. I'm sorry. Okay. It may be easier then for me to share and you to read off your text if you would like to do that. I'm so sorry to have interrupted you halfway through. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. No, no worries. It's the first time that I'm okay. This is was my first attempt as at having uh, the screen and the text on the 
Absolutely uh, understandable. If you, I will put it up, and if you just want to tell me next, um, I'll go ahead and send to presentation view, and hopefully it looks full screen. Okay. For you, um, and I will catch up with where you were. Okay. That looks great, Sarah. That's perfect. Okay, great. Sarah Leonard, that's perfect. Yes. yes. All right. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Sarah. Okay. Uh, just one second. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, where was I? Um, yeah. Um, so sulfur dioxide, sorry, <laughs> was praised for its deodorizing properties and air cleaning qualities. So if looked at from an environmental perspective, what appears therefore is that Turner's works reveal this profound ambivalence, a simultaneous attraction and apprehension as viewers are drawn in by the very forces that possess the capacity to obliterate. The idea that Turner's engagements with the material surfaces of his works testified to the ever-changing experiences of early industrialization was already formulated in Turner's time. As one anonymous writer penned in 1844, the railways have furnished Turner with a new field for the exhibition of his eccentric style. And it is such a perspective that found resonance, the resonance in William Rotner's 1997 influential work on Turner's Industrial Revolution slide. In his formal analysis, Rotner showed how steam provided an apt medium for an artist increasingly inclined towards the dissolution of form slide. He further argues that steam held appeal for Turner because it offered an opportunity for him to work with the color black. Slide. Yet, despite this perspective's ability to bridge the formal and social aspects of Turner's work, it still grappled with the challenge of aligning Turner's innovative style with his profound engagement with the tangible material world without resorting to a causal explanation, i.e. it's because of changes in the atmosphere that Turner liberated his brush. I contend, therefore, that it is through another transformative perspective, the ecocritical turn, that Turner's attention to these matters can be reprocessed. Uh, Slide and yeah, uh, next slide, next slide, next slide. Sorry, next slide. Yes, in Turner's view of London, uh, Greenwich from Greenwich, the foreground is jumbled with maps and globes, while the background is enshrouded in various billowing clouds of smoke and steam. Positioned at the periphery, we observe this scene from beyond the whirlwind that Turner would later frequently envelop his viewers in. Here we bear witness to the relics, such as the historical maps of the city. Similarly, in Wreckers, debris, um, slide and slide. Just, um, Debris, flotsam and jetsam washed um, ashore to be scavenged, emerged from the sea as emblematic of the things and people, here one can also think of slavers, that were being marginalized by the centrifugal force of the Industrial Revolution, as steam provided greater control over subordinate labor. This is uh, the idea that Amy brilliantly underscored in her analysis of how fishermen would be, were being pushed aside by tourism in Brighthelstone, Sussex. Slide. In Cooking with Mud, the idea of mess in 19th century art and fiction, David Trotter adopts a, phen a phenomenological perspective to an analyze what he refers to as Turner's litter. As he contends in many of Turner's works, we encounter natural debris such as decaying vegetables, scattered fish, and more bro broadly, remnants of human presence. Slide. In Turner's art, in contrast to genre paintings where rummages appear sporadically, litter is integral to the aesthetics. 
Trotter's exploration, however, does not encompass the more elusive and immaterial manifestations of waste that is atmospheric pollution, the microscopic particles, aerosols, molecules, and organisms. What Michel Serre would probably call quasi-objects, a concept designates the intersection of the anthropogenic and the natural, which surpasses familiar boundaries and challenges traditional categories of thought. In light of this, I aim to further expand upon the implications hinted at in Trotter's study by delving into the realms of ecocriticisms, ecocriticism and of one of its subfields, atmospheric studies. In Turner's works, waste such as atmospheric pollution serves as a trace that simultaneously functions as material evidence of its making, but also of what it stands for. And this, I believe, is precisely where ecocriticism finds its relevance, as it allows us to see Turner's works as both the tangible artifacts of their time and symbolic narratives of what they embody, shifting the point of view from what these paintings represent to what they are. Literary analysis and con concept Consequently, ecocritical methods, which emphasize the inherent connection between form and content, are especially suitable in this context. In this framework, there is no rigid distinction between form and substance. Rather, ecocriticism invites us to consider the pollution of Turner's paintings rather than in them. In the sky of our manufacture, Jesse Oak Taylor thus writes that smog does not simply emerge at the intersection of nature and culture, but that it emerges as that intersection. Expanding on such an idea, Mark Cheatham poses the question of how atmospheres can simultaneously be tangible and metaphorical, of how they can exist as both figurative and material, abstract and grounded, in reality. Following these readings, Turner's paintings not only depict the environment, but materialize it with their substances. The polluted atmospheres are not only represented, but conveyed in and through his works. Taking a deeper dive, one can even examine how Turner's paintings bear physically um, the evidence of past pollution preserved in the artwork. Can traces of coal, wood, or tobacco be discerned through techniques like cross-section or ultraviolet imagery in Turner's paintings? And that's, I guess, a question for Joyce. Um, conservators such as Sarah Cove have shown that artists like Constable would intentionally lighten their canvases to counteract the darkening impact of pollution. It is in this intersection, I believe, of social art history, ecocriticism, and technical art history that the material and immaterial, the signified and the signifier, um, uh, I mean, that, that Turner's work keeps unfolding. An ecomaterialist approach therefore prompts us to not only examine the paintings of smog and steam, but to scrutinize all of Turner's works through this lens slide. As uh, demonstrated by the scientific study mentioned in the introduction, sulfur dioxide wasn't confined to the sources visible in Turner's works, such as kilns, uh, kilns slide, uh, chimneys, um, two slides, and funnels, slide, slide, it permeated many of his artworks, influencing, influencing their light and ambience. Consequently, one could argue that all of Turner's landscapes are open to ecological interpretation. As Frédéric Auger has convincingly uh, shown, there is a remarkable coincidence in Britain of the Industrial Revolution with the rise of landscape as a preeminent pictorial genre. An eco-materialist perspective invites us to consider how Turner's paintings outscale their very presence, both spatially and temporally, from extraction to transplantation and pollution. 
one way to do this is examining how they, in their very materiality, convey narratives of extraction. Uh, consider graphite, as Toba has acutely demonstrated yesterday, but one could also look at Turner's pigments, slide, such as, for example, Indian yellow, derived from concentrated urine uh, obtained from cows fed on a diet of mango leaves in rural India and whose manufacturing process was conducted in exploitative conditions. Slide. The scientific studies mentioned in the introduction characterized Turner's works as impressionists. Such an anachronism, though, though eyebrow raising for Turner scholars, is a trope of Turner criticism, reaching its peak in Gowing's framing of Turner as proto abstract. I believe that such a teleological reading may have, as a result, perhaps, for a time, prevented scholars from associating uh, contemporary ecological concerns with Turner's experiments. And while it is important not to turn Turner into a proto-ecologist, um, I hope I have shown that focusing on the ambivalence of his works viewed through an ecological lens doesn't necessarily prevent us from revisiting the historical circumstances that shaped them. Perhaps then can anachronisms also encourage us to explore alternative connections between Turner's body of work and our current climate crisis, between Turner's industrial sublime and our toxic sublime, uh, symbolized by ubiquitous images of yellow sulfur dioxide laden, la, uh, laden skies. Slide. Such hazy, womb-like images bear a striking resemblance to the early days of Instagram filtered posts. Yet they are no filter, and moreover represent a sky whose very filter has been altered. A sky where smoke particles have modified the atmosphere's filtering properties, resulting in the absorption of green, blue, indigo, and violet wavelengths, while diffusing the red, orange, and yellow tones. Slide. In the Tate Britain Claw Gallery rehang, Sunset Provisioning by Yuri Patterson, which is positioned so as to face a group of Turner watercolors is an installation which incorporates digital tracking of local pollution levels, utilizing a sophisticated monitoring system that mimics unnatural sunsets. The more the pollution level increases, the more spectacular and colorful the rendering becomes. In its beauty, the installation delights us at the same time as it indicts. The device the artist insists is independent of local government agencies and of official monitoring systems, or lack of them thereof. It's a critical work, contrary to perhaps to the immersive artistic experiences that Ellen, uh, Alan Braddock describes as, I quote, commodifications of atmospheric sensory experience. Braddock mentions Eliasson's weather project, where the reference to Turner is prominently acknowledged. So could a piece like Patterson's uh, combined to present day paradigm of ecological thinking invite us to re-examine Turner's art, Turner's filters, not only metaphorically, that is in light of modernist discourses which hypostatized his, its materiality, but concretely and post-anthropocentrically. Perhaps ironically, it is only by doing so on the painter's own terms and resisting the anachronistic attribution of contemporary concerns to historical uh, actors that we can excavate the genuine politics that shaped the art objects on this study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, uh, for a brilliant uh, talk, which I think um, really took seriously the historiographic kind of trajectory of this whole conference and also took us back in a way that I certainly had never imagined to Gowing versus Ber uh, Berger and Gage as a kind of founding moment of ecological discourse. I'm sure there will be lots of questions for you. And just a reminder to everyone to type uh, your questions for our speakers into the Q&A. We'll have a discussion at the end of this session. So uh, now we turn to our next speaker, uh, who is Matthew Hunter. 
Matthew teaches in the Department of Art History and Communication Studies at McGill University in Montreal. Um, he's the author of two uh, really remarkably provocative and original books, Painting with Fire, Sir Joshua Reynolds' Photography and the Temporarily Evolving Chemical Object of 2020, and before that, Wicked Intelligence, Visual Art and the Science of Experiment in Restoration London. They're on uh, required reading for all of us in uh, uh, the history of British art, both published by the uh, University of Chicago Press. And uh, Matthew is also an editor of Grey Room. Um, his talk today, The Sun is God, takes us into the discourse of economics with the subtitle Turner, Angerstein and Insurance. So over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Tim. Uh, thanks, panelists. Um, and thanks, organizers. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Uh, sorry. Just a second. Oh, sorry about this. Anyway, um, okay. A conversation with a contemporary curator planning an art exhibition often turns to the matter of insurance. Standard Equipment for Arts Transit Insurance now acts as judge of art's monetary value. Underwriters arbitrate conditions of display. They guard the occasion of art's movement. So one art world commentator observes, Quote, art insurance is huge business, and not least now that artworks move around the world in far greater volume and frequency than ever before. Unquote. Coextensive then with the problems of movement, empire, and global exchange that have guided much recent art historiography, insurance and its coming into the thick of artistic practice are also conspicuously absent from disciplinary attention. How might such a story be told? The proposition of this paper is simple. Turner, especially when paired with Lloyd's underwriter, John Julius Angerstein, who was an early patron, provides an archive for documenting the tentacular extension of insurance through the making, moving, selling, showing, and being of art in late 19th and early, sorry, late 18th and early 19th century Britain briefly sketching something of the messy elliptical web of Turner's own crossings with underwriting. I suggest how closer attention to insurance complicates some standard art historical tales while opening new avenues for critical attention. To get to those points, consider a modestly sized watercolor shown in Somerset House's antique room at the Royal Academy's summer exhibition of 1792. Fire has carved out a cavern on Oxford Street. Frosty morning sunlight breaks over the shoulder of the crest-bearing porch of the wrecked Pantheon Theater. Yes, handbills do remain affixed to the Ashlar blocks at center right. Sure, unscathed Doric columns do continue to carry the theater's temple front, but fire has shattered the arched window above. The damage worsens as the building ascends. Attic level, windows punctured, balustrade broken, the theater's roof has been consumed entirely, bearing the structure to the open sky. The watercolor is, of course, the work of a 17-year-old Turner. As Leo Costello has persuasively argued, the picture augurs the prophecy of fire that burns through Turner's oeuvre, about which we've heard much from Sarah's talk today, from uh, Frederic's. Um, talk yesterday, the steamboats, railroads, industrial smog, and other effects of coal-fired power, and all this painted in colors so vibrant that one wag in 1832 would hope that, quote, the academy is insured, or perhaps the picture is painted on a canvas of asbestos, unquote. Such claims persist into recent interpretation. Turner is, per Michel Serre, Quote, the introduction of igneous matter into culture, the first real genius of thermodynamics, unquote. And yet, 
that 1792 watercolor perhaps says less about fire than it does about fire insurance. Live read firefighters in their reds and their blues part the crowds gawking at the smoky spectacle. Like the motley melee and WH Pines, 1804 Aquitan, Turner populates his foreground with the insurance company firefighters who responded to conflagrations in the era before municipal firefighting companies. A fireman in blue livery stands before the icicle encrusted pump number five of the Royal Exchange Assurance Company. He empties a bucket bearing the plumed portcullis logo of the Westminster Insurance Office onto a cylindrical roller equipment on which the painter has affixed his signature, W. Turner. So painting insurers firefighters in 1792, Turner soon began insuring his own art against fire, identifying in 1797 as, quote, a dealer in pictures and drawings, unquote, a 22-year-old Turner then purchased 300 pounds of indemnity from Sun Insurance, leading player among London's big three fire underwriters. The property he insured was at number 26 Maiden Lane. That was the address he had listed in the 1792 Academy catalog and was, of course, Turner's childhood home, the site of the barbershop where his father, apparently also a son client in the 1790s, had first displayed the painter's drawings. We can identify that site with significant precision thanks to period visualizations themselves made by insurers. What I show you here is a detail of Covent Garden from a facsimile of the 32 sheet map of London produced in the 1790s by Richard Horwood under subsidy from Phoenix Assurance, another leading fire underwriter. Turner, I should hasten to add, was not alone among art world figures then using insurance. In the, in the years around 1800, buccaneering art dealer William Buchanan was instructing agents looting paintings from Napoleonic Italy on where to find cheapest insurance rates when shipping art back to Britain. And Swiss wild child Henry Fusely was insuring the paintings, drawings, wearing apparel and plate in his own Marlebone home against fire. But as Sam Smiles, the late Eric Shanes, and others have noted, insurance was an interestingly consistent concern for Turner, that supposed doyen of sublimity. His 1797 Sun policy covered only, quote, unsold stock in his dwelling. But Turner expanded his fire insurance coverage once he became a full academician, moved to Marlebone, and opened his private gallery. On March 29th, of 1804, Turner bought fire insurance from the Sun covering, quote, pictures not exceeding 1,000 pounds, along with 300 pounds of indemnity on, quote, the picture room behind his dwelling house, brick, no stove. Acquiring additional fire insurance policies on his gallery and later his pub in Wapping, Turner would invest at significant profit in stock in the Atlas Fire Insurance Company, when it began trading in 1808. By 1832, fire insurance enters into the legal fate of Turner's art. The first codicil to his will instructed Turner's executors to pay, quote, all necessary charges for keeping and taking care, insurance from fire, preservation, cleansing, and holding the same as Turner's gallery, unquote. So note that when this will was first written and revised to include insurance, the National Gallery receiving Turner's benefaction was intimately tied to insurance, particularly to marine underwriter John Julius Angerstein. Much of the gallery's founding collection de derived from Parliament's purchase of Angerstein's own art collection, of course. And the gallery had opened in 1824 inside Angerstein's townhouse on Pall Mall. No, Angerstein did not buy Turner's Pantheon watercolor, but he did famously set the price for and acquire a Turner watercolor of Carnophone Castle in the late 1790s. An underwriter of marine traffic who used those great redistributions of European art known as the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars to acquire prestigious paintings of marine voyages, Angerstein simultaneously gave Turner formative sight of work by Claude Lorraine. 
So Turner's executor, George Jones, would recount in 1851, quote, when Turner was very young, he went to see Agerstein's pictures. Looking at the seaport by Claude, Turner was awkward, agitated, and burst into tears. Mr. Angerstein inquired why he was weeping when Turner said passionately, because I shall never be able to paint anything like that picture. A mythical as such an account may be, Turner did, of course, stipulate in his will that Dido building Carthage and sun rising through vapor be given to the National Gallery on the condition that they, quote, be hung, kept, and placed, that is to say, always between two pictures from Angerstein's own collection of Claude's, namely Claude's landscape with the marriage of Isaac and Rebecca and Seaport with the embarkation of the Queen of Sheba. So made contingent upon the purchase of fire insurance by the 1831 codicil, Turner's art was to hang alongside Angerstein's emblems of marine traffic, as of course it continues to do, inside a home built from, or first built from, marine insurance. Now, as Sam Smiles demonstrated some 15 years ago, the insurantial connections between Turner and Angerstein were also older and darker. Smiles then unearthed unambiguous evidence detailing the roles of Turner and Angerstein in a scheme supporting a Jamaican cattle plantation operated through slave labor. Bought in 1805, thus on the very cusp of Britain's 1807 abolition of slave trading, the investment was a tontine, a kind of rough and ready life insurance policy. While Smiles discounts the possibility that Angerstein introduced the scheme to Turner, Angerstein not only invested in the same tontine, but had even been uh, proposed as a trustee for it may be signaled by that cloud of smoke drifting upward at left. Something of insurance's darkness registers already in the 1792 watercolor. After all, then fought by insurers, firemen, the Pantheon fires conflagration was soon suspected as an insurance crime. First designed by architect James Wyatt, with whom we know Turner is closely connected through Helen's wonderful talk, um, in the years around 17, 1769 to 72, the venue had been hastily retrofitted as an opera house in 1790. Hopeless for operatic purposes, the theater became a crushing financial burden. Quote, the fire that rid the opera's backers of this albatross was, as historians of the site have concluded, remarkably convenient for them. Within a week of the blaze, London's newspapers reported a carpenter offering to disclose the identity of the persons who had set the Pantheon on fire to the aggrieved underwriters. Of course, the familiar art historical story is that half a century later, Turner would give searing expression to criminal violence perpetrated to leverage insurance payments in his apocal vision of the traffic in human lives. Shown at the Royal Academy in 1840, Turner's slavers throwing overboard the dead and dying, Typhon coming on with a slave ship, has become the iconic visualization of insurance logic in Western art. The painting is conventionally taken as a meditation on the jettison of 133 sickened captives from the slave ship Zong under command of Luke Collingwood representing the Liverpool-based slaving syndicate of William Gregson, off Jamaica over three days in late November and early December, 1781. The Zong case gained particular infamy when through two trials in 1783, the Gregson syndicate plied the voyages underwriters for recompense of mass murder as an insurable loss at sea. In a longer version of this project than I can present here, I try to herd the evidence of Turner's own web of underwriting activity into art historical service. First, taking on board the late arrival of the Zong and thus insurance into the slave ship's historiography in the later 1950s, as astutely pointed out by the late John McCubrey, I highlight the slipperiness of this connection and the tactics that have been required to sustain it. What I'm gesturing to here in this um, compressed slide is sort of sum of this argument. And some of the usual stories go that um, Turner was inspired to paint the slave ship by, among other things, the issuing of a second edition of 
Thomas Clarkson's History of the Abolitionist Movement in 1839 is an argument that's advanced by the late Albert Boehm, for example. But Boehm makes the claim and attaches it to visual evidence, uh, as we see in the figure in the middle of my little assemblage here, um, by marshalling into interpretive service a set of plates from the 1808 edition of Clarkson's work. Similarly, there's a story told in which uh, rockets and blue light, um, a picture at the Clark Institute shown alongside and as an opposition to the slave ship in 1840 um, as a kind of pendant structure that secures the horror of slavery to the past and looks to a brighter future of imperial existence for Britain. Um, but that story is told by Ian Balcom in a very, influ a very influential account. Um, doesn't note that the two paintings were actually shown not in the same gallery in the 1840 exhibition. And of course, Macubri calls attention to this object that's floating in the sea, which he identifies as an Argentine flag, uh, a flag of convenience for Iberian slavers, by which he argues that on the evidence of the picture, the picture is not a representation of the Zong and the horrors of slavery's violence in the 18th century, but of continuing ongoing slaving atrocities in the 1830s. Second, I build on work of Leo Costello, Ian Balcom, Christina Sharp, and others to exposit the slave ship's figuration of the beholder through the techniques of insurance that Turner had been purchasing for nearly half a century. Particularly relevant here is the concept of general average or the proportional parsing of responsibility among a population for willful sacrifice executed to sustain a common interest. Extending to the beholder an insurantial position justifiable within Turner's youth, the picture invites a beholder to something like seeing like a slaver, a proposition squaring with the abject revulsion that met the picture in 1840 as supposedly abolitionist Britain then used actuarial techniques to pay off former slave owners in what Nicholas Draper has called the price of emancipation paid by parliament. And yet to fixate on the slave ships in serantial moorings is I think to miss a larger story. That is the extent of insurance's penetration through the art world of Turner's era. Consider the year 1810, when amidst the ongoing economic crises of the Napoleonic Wars, a group of London-based artists established the Artist Annuity Fund, or AAF as I'll call it. While officers in the AAF were contemporaneously designing iconography for insurance companies, as in Arthur William Davis's proposed logo for Rock Assurance, the group's totemic image was actuarial. A life insurance table prepared by an actuary at that same rock assurance, which tied premium rates of, to the age of the artist claimant. <clears throat> What's fascinating to see here is how quickly the AAF shifted from a moral conception of health with an exceptionally bad choice of Benjamin Robert Hayden into a medicalized model of life as artists are abstracted, shorn of particularizing detail and liquidated into actuaries risk pools. But as argued by John Pye, the group's most articulate spokesman, who is both Gillian Forrester and John Bonehill, um, have noted already, was working with Turner from around 1811. This mix of discipline and biopolitics was not alienation. Rather, it was freedom. Given the Royal Academy's stranglehold on exhibition proceeds, its de facto abandonment, of the art world's most vulnerable, what most needed ensuring in the first decades of Britain's 19th century was not the expensive art in Turner's gallery. Instead, Pye claimed assurance was acutely needed by the proverbial 99% of London's artistic population. Turner, of course, knew all this. Between 1815 and 1830, he served as chairman and treasurer for the rival artist general benevolent institution. <coughs> Angerstein was a donor to that charity by 1818. Annuities 
Sales of investments, charitable concerns figure centrally in Turner's wills, documents drafted amidst Parliament's devastating amendments to the poor law. In short, by gently turning from the visual field privileged by art historical investigation, we find the invisible commodity of insurance everywhere. It is there as Turner makes, moves, shows, sells, acquires, and scheme to, schemes to keep art always. It forms the texture for available conceptions of what art is, what social good its makers can do. And yet, it is also visible. By the mid-1830s, insurance had entered directly into Turner's exhibited oil pictures. At right in the version of the burning of the houses of Parliament, now in Cleveland stands a light of boats, which point diagonally toward the central column of fire. <clears throat> that last vessel in the train is a firefighting engine on which Turner has inscribed in minuscule characters the name and the solar engine, ensign of his longtime insurer, Sun Fire. That ensign set amidst the larger itinerary of insurantial intersections mapped by Turner's art compels us at the very least to rethink the meaning of the painter's mythical dying words, the sun is God. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for um, a, a talk which uses a range of primary sources, which art historians have, to my knowledge, never, ever been near before to, to, to offer a revelatory uh, account of Turner. And um, I, I again encourage everyone to put uh, questions for Matthew in the Q&A um, uh, function. So uh, now moving to our final speaker, last but by no means least, um, Aurélie Petio, who is a lecturer in the history of art at Université Paris-Nanterre, where she works primarily on the history of the arts and crafts movement. Um, and indeed, her PhD thesis at the University of Cambridge was devoted to Charles Robert Ashby and his pedagogy. But she's currently working on a very important project, which takes us to the issue of language, um, the translation of Turner's correspondence into French. Um, she's also working uh, on a separate uh, project on the contribution of the arts and crafts movement in British ruled territories from 1860 to 1848. And uh, she's the author of a French language monograph on pre-Raphaelitism and the arts and crafts movement. But today she's going to talk about her new work, uh, Translating Turner, the French edition of the correspondence. Aurélie. Can you see my screen? I think you need to put it on to present mode, make it full screen, that's it. Thank you so much for this kind introduction. And I'd like to thank the YCBA for organizing this symposium and for the wonderful papers we've had for that these two days. It would be too fanciful to suggest that his liberties with English, which make reading him a sometimes taxing experience or of the same orders as his liberties with the traditional structures of landscape, wrote John Gage to the preface, to the collected correspondence. Um, Gerald Ziff also writes about the verbal maze that uh, comes out of Turner's lecture. <clears throat> this paper we thus present a slightly misochistic task, which consists in translating Turner's correspondence into French. This project actually stems from my master's one thesis on an idea by Isabelle Boudinot and which was supervised by Frédéric Auger, whom I both thank here. 18 years later, the annotated translation, which I'm currently revising and improving, is to be published by Cohen and Cohen Editions. The aim of this project is to present a French audience with the correspondence as an accessible tool to shed light on the many facets of Turner's work and personality. Lecturing on a variety of topics pertaining to British art in France, I'm convinced of the necessity of access through teaching and translation of British art, especially after Brexit. Sharing Turner, essentially, as one of the panels yesterday was so, be so beautifully themed. So I'm not that crazy because Turner is one of the most well-known, best-loved British artists in France. Exhibitions never fail to attract crowds with record attendance. 50,000 people uh, attended Turner is a pound, Turner and his painters. Um, and the 2020 exhibition at Jacques Marandré led newspaper La Croix to uh, write Turner, the friend of deconfinement, as if 
people were so familiar with Turner's work that this exhibition was um, like joining an old friend after this um, terrible period of confinement. So regular exhibitions are organized in France, monographic group ones. They present mostly white themes, paintings beloved by the public. And that's one point this project seeks to do, uh, which is to grant direct access to a more varied uh, array of themes and aspects of Turner's life and work to a wide Francophone audience. A second one is to spark further um, research in French universities. In recent years, I could count a couple of PhD theses, not solely focusing on Turner, and not many master theses either, as the students uh, fear everything must have been written on Turner. Beyond Turnerian studies, this project also strives to think and rethink the notion of Britishness, which from France still remains a very exotic one. Obviously, we're talking here of an imagined, constructed, perceived Britishness, what Richard Jones termed its own rain-soaked national mythology, which still echoes in France. Although recent work on Britishness obviously points out to the necessity to reflect on questions of race, gender, and environment, among others. So why the letters and not other fundamental texts? To my knowledge, only two texts have been translated into French text by Turner. The Royal Academy Lecture on Backgrounds, Introduction of Architecture and Landscape by Pierre Vett in 2010, and The Fallacies of Hope by Christopher Lucan in 2005. The letters reveal the network of relationships Turner maintained, his relationship to British landscapes, his relationship to patrons and engravers, as we've seen earlier, the idiosyncrasies of the Royal Academy, varnishing days, gifts he receives, and Turner's own contribution to the construction of his artistic reputation. But there's also more personal letters. As Amy Kankanen has uh, said yesterday, the experience of being a human in the world shows through the letters. The correspondence belongs to what Philippe Lejeune has termed the auto autobiographical pact. The letters produce a true narrative which leads the reader to understand the cultural ecology of the writer. True as in participating in, whether consciously or not, um, the construction of a persona. The correspondence is a genre in itself. Correspondence from the 19th century is kept, classified, copied, amended, and often published posthumously. It also has a perf performative dimension, which uses the rhetoric of persuasion to obtain something, in Turner's case, money, attention, uh, but also changes to his production through his letters to his engravers. But also following Philippe Dagen on Van Gogh's correspondence, in giving whole letters and not selecting extracts, correspondence participates in an exercise in anti-mythology. It's also what Gage affirms in his preface to his edition. He wishes to refute the myth of an asocial, grumpy Turner incapable of communicating. The biographies by Thornbury and Finberg right up to Mike Lee's film in 2014, had perpetuated this image. Lastly, the correspondence allows for various readings, the autobiographical value of it, the sometimes poetic value, the genetic of the works. It all functions as a precious tool, even if in Turner's case, it is an incom incomplete one. So uh, what shape is this project going to take? Obviously, it relies heavily on uh, John Gage's masterful work, which uh, forms the, the basis of the edition of the letters. It comprises roughly 360 letters from 1802 to 1851, and Gage's faithful transcription and sometimes careful interpretation of Turner's handwritten letters or invaluable and colossal work, which I'm very glad it did, but I don't have to do. The numbers assigned to the letters in the 1980 edition have been retained for ease of reference to that volume with the added letter found by Gage and published in Turner Studies in 19, 1986. Others will be added as they come to light on auction sites or elsewhere. I found a couple that were published in other books, uh, for instance, um, on books and still engraved book illustration in England. 
Um, so sometimes one or two letters might have evaded Gage's careful attention, but uh, no more than a couple or a rare letter in private hands might resurface. And if anyone knows of unpublished letters or newly discovered ones, please get in touch. This edition will, um, for the moment, because it's still work in progress, not follow a chronological order, nor a linear, linear biographical construction. It will be organized around four themes with in introductory chapters, taking uh, in account the French readership. So uh, the four themes echo statistically uh, the repartition of the letters, which um, focus more about First, topography and trips, second, patrons and friends, third, engravers, and lastly, the relationship between Turner and the Royal, Royal Academy and other institutions. So each of these parts will come with a contextual introduction, and they will be illustrated when possible by works or engravings um, that talked about in the letters. The annotation, which obviously rely greatly on Gage's gigantic work, will be simplified, will be slightly less erudite and more accessible to a French audience. It will um, also reference more recent scholarship on Turner. And already all the talks today and yesterday have given me some ideas. There will be also suggestions in an index to mine the correspondence for other themes, the weather, color, time, food even, uh, and there's one example here on the screen, uh, food which might seem a slightly um, unimportant topic, but which testifies to the evolution of Turner's relationship, in this case with Walter Fawkes and his family. At the beginning of their relationship, the two men had merely a professional contact, but through the letters and the correspondence, you can see it evolve. And I really like the letter. Um, three exclamation marks, many thanks for three PPP, that is pie, pheasant and pud, Christmas cheers in Queen Anne Street, which really um, makes Turner's personality shine through his humorous nature. Uh, some um, specificities of Turner's correspondence is that it is not complete. Um, it is uh, both a correspondence that's active, so from Turner and passive to Turner. A number of things are missing that one might like to find, such as there's little mention of his readings, very little about his lecturing position on contemporary events, political opinions. Um, one thing that will also not be produced is the diary that Gages um, showed in his edition because um, he rejected his attribution to Turner in that Turner Studies um, article in 1986. Another point, which I will also go back to later, is the materiality of the letters. That is paper, folding of the paper, the format, the ink, the evolution of the writing that will be introduced um, in the introduction. But, um, it's what is termed epistolary rituals, and it's very interesting, but one cannot do that for each letter. Uh, here you have an example of a letter to Robert Stevenson, uh, and you can see the postscriptum, which is rendered roughly like this on a page. And obviously, um, it's the main text um, has quite a business tone to it. And the more friendly uh, tone is to be found in the postscriptum. And um, so the position of some of the parts of the letter on the actual paper actually matter. The letters rarely contain doodles. So that's four represented in um, Gage's edition. And uh, so they are um, reproduced by Gage. So one you can find here is a quick uh, line showing a route that William de Lummer should, according to Turner, take to see Welsh landmarks. Another one is a sketch of four marine topics suggested to Sir John Fleming Leicester. And there's another one about a frame for, a section of a frame for the Bell Light House. And a last one of a humorous doodle to Clara Wells. Um, that's the letter related to 
I'm also uh, thinking of doing what Gage said he wouldn't do, which is include some of the annotations on the engravings or uh, working proofs, because they do relate to quite a lot of the letters, which you can see here for an engraving about Mercury in Argus. And the text uh, on the top right corner uh, and bottom corner of the engraving <coughs> really uh, completes the letters and give uh, a more um, technical, uh, adds a technical aspect to them. So uh, now to the actual translation, the challenges and a couple of case studies, not too much. Um, Turner's correspondence really is situated between, well, the translation is situated between a literary translation and a technical one, given the way Turner writes, which will be made evident in a couple of articles. There's some um, easy points First, some translations that are quite obvious components of the season when it's written near Christmas will be translated at meilleur vœu. So that's colloquialism that just translates easily, but it's actually, the rest is not that easy. Uh, there are recurring errors that Turn uh, Gage has smoothed out in his edition for the sake of readability. He has indicated when some words were biffed and he also indicates when they're illegible and sometimes he proposes a extrapolation on a word. And one point to be taken into account for the writing of these letters is Turner's potential dyslexia, which Andrew Wilton supported in painting and poetry in 1919. But to disprove this point, neuroscientist Brian Butterworth wrote in 1992 in Turner Studies that it had long been proven that Turner was an avid reader with a great library, which in itself disproves dyslexia, a trouble that affects reading and writing. And he then proceeds to analyze occurrences of misspelled words in Turner's own hands found in lectures and shows, for instance, that some are due to the unfixed nature of spelling at the time, the standardization of English starts in the 1700s through handbooks, but is not homogeneous until the 1830s and does not quite affect lower middle class as the rest of the population. And is then a great more uh, standardized in the development of the press and popular literature. Other spelling mistakes might be due to Turner's Cockney accent. Um, landscape is often spelt with an I, endeavor with an I as well. But a more telling example, which shows the difficulty of translation and choices to be made, is uh, to be found in let letter 30, where um, Turner writes the word rabbit for rebate, which is a section of a, a frame. It could be Turner's Cockney accent, it could be dyslexia, could also be that the word rebate comes from the French rabat, which um, was indeed sometimes pronounced rabbit. This is where, as in other occurrences, a translation choice between source text and target, target text must be made. Whatever the reason, the word rabbit in, in this context is quite incongruous. Should the translator keep it? Um, that word in French translates as feuillure. So um, one has found a word that sounds similar in French, but means something completely different to retain the incongruity in the text. But it's not that easy with the word for you because most of the word in for you share the same root. Um, should the translator erase the specificities? But I haven't decided on translation for this word, but I do think it's important to retain these oddities in the target text because it's the only way to hear a little of Turner's voice, his accent, and to bring him to life. Another point of interest here um, for the translation of the correspondence is the punctuation. Betterworth analyzes a lecture which Turner had marked in red paint for poses for a smoother oral delivery. According to him, most poses fall at major grammatical boundaries, 
thus disproving that Turner had grammatical issues of any sort. For the purpose of translation, one may thus infer that these long convoluted uh, sentences in the letters are due to either desire for speediness when writing or laziness. This effect should be kept up to the point when understanding starts to suffer. And if you read some of the letters, this is a very simple one with no punctuation at all. If you read it out loud, uh, it's complicated and it makes translation a little bit harder. Finally, one last point among uh, many others, still in letter 30, which shows that in each letter, there's lots of questions. Um, there's um, an example of what a French readership typically needs help with. So all the references to Oxford and the clericals and the beadle, and especially here, a proctor's gown. Um, maybe Harry Potter helps a bit to understand now what a gown is, but to translate what a gown is, there's no right word in French. So you could use the word robe that refers mostly to lawyers and judges, and that's how it's translated in Harry Potter, but with an added um, word, octage, which refers more to antiquity. And then there's the word proctor. If um, this were a literary translation, one might choose to find a loose equivalent, such as surveillant. But here, both exact terms matter because um, they are, sorry, because um, they are in a postscriptum which checks the veracity of the, de the depiction for High Street Oxford. So uh, Turner goes back and forth um, asking what he should do about certain figures and what is specifically exact. So here, um, because both words are together, it makes it really hard to um, use what is called incrementalization, that is developing the units of meaning. You could say um, a typical robe that, in French, la, la robe typique que porte le, pro, le proctor. Um, if you use what is called a report, meaning you only use the English term with an, a little footnote, um, that doesn't work here because there's two words that need report or incrementalization. So there's a myriad of other examples which uh, need explanation and which, if doing so, uh, might ruin the, the aspect of Turner's letter. Some um, expressions, could wish you if possible to secure a bed, could wish it warmer weather, um, could also be uh, flattened in a way. But the question arises as to uh, whether it's just a 19th century way of speaking, whether if, because Turner used them, uses them a lot, if it's specific to him. In that case, French translation would be more, uh, je souhaiterais, j'aimerais, less heavy than je pourrais souhaiter que, but, um, but retaining them might also mean it's closer to Turner's style of writing. So this question sometimes is turning into interpolation about who, how Turner was, if he's convoluted or obsequious on purpose, if on the contrary, it's a regular occurrence that should be kept as a trait of writing. And finally, there's all the sentences that remain very cryptic and as cryptic as the paintings presented yesterday by Richard Johnson and Amy Concannon in the discussion. To conclude, uh, what further use of the letters? So there's been an, an interesting discussion about how to display the letters, how to include them in exhibitions. There's um, an artist, Tessa Sultan, who's been working with the letters as a material and Sam Smiles has written about her work related to um, the materiality of the letters. He writes, that is a pity for we lose sight of the physical quality of his missives, the fact that they're not actually um, easily foundable online, for instance. That's a pity for we lose sight of the physical quality of his missives, the different writing materials he used, the changes in his writing over the years, the occasional inclusion of sketches and above all, the way the script sits on the page as the immediate material trace of his thoughts and sometimes his second thoughts too. 
Tessa Sultan works by constructing palimpsests with the letters, reproducing them from archives at the British Library, the Royal Academy, superimposing them on each other from 2017, and then in 2019 onto maps of London, dating 1799, providing a photography of Turner's London, his houses, the Royal Academy, etc., um, and allows the viewer to um, dwell into some writing and intimacy, words remaining legible um, on the work. That's another example. A larger and wider question would be that of a digital edition. It would support both specialist and non-specialist access to what is a complex archive. It would also allow for data mining that um, paper edition does not provide, uh, visualization, cartographic representations. Basically, using Marianne Jacobi's terms, it could turn the letters into hyper letters. A digital edition would thus allow for easy identification of correspondence, works, methods. It could also allow for other translations into various languages, work on um, linguistic work on word occurrences, more uh, thematic crossovers, data visualization of networks of correspondence, access to the various works of. Um, uh, the states of the engravings, for instance, and a model for that is Vincent uh, Van Gogh's digital edition of the letters, which um, enable you to have the text or translation um, links to different works of art. But obviously, um, there are issues to uh, this project, which is just an afterthought for the moment. Um, as highlighted yesterday about the, the database, it needs an institution to host this project and to fund it. Uh, one might think also about the sustainability of it. So um, lots of questions and endless possibilities still with these letters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aurelie, for that um, speech. And I think it's it's really important that Turner is accessible in other languages and you're doing a, a, a extremely important work as I think everyone on this call will, will appreciate. So thank you for that. If our speakers could all unmute themselves um, and um, we've got a few minutes left for questions. I did note Aurelie's mention of pie, pheasant and pud, which reminds me that it's approaching uh, lunchtime in America, probably dinner time in, in Europe. So um, we should not go on too long, but I had one very general question, which I'd like you all to answer perhaps in the order of um, uh, that you spoke. And then we'll, we've got a couple of uh, more focused questions and then we'll end with another big one. So the first question takes us back to where we started this morning, um, which is the issue of whether there is an early and a late Turner, and how in your own studies of Turner in relation to um, e ecology, questions of ecology, in relation to questions of capitalism, insurance, the financial markets, and in his letters, whether you felt that the the periodization of Turner into an early and a middle and a late or an early and a late um, actually has has meaning or significance for your projects. So perhaps Sarah, you could speak to that first. Yeah, thank you for this really thought provoking question. Uh, the more I work on Turner, the more I um, tend to uh, I mean, follow what Leo Costello was uh, saying earlier on and 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 no, I mean, yeah, and 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 try to find perhaps um, point of prisms that encom encompass his whole, whole career, especially since I mean, as I said in my presentation, it's late Turners that really uh, focused the intention on. Um, questions of matter and materiality and. Um, and 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 we do that. I mean, as Sam smiles uh, also uh, brilliantly put, we we do that with most most uh, artists. We tend to see their late careers as being more virtuosic, and so I try actually not to um, dichotomize Turner as much as I would before. But 
Interesting, thank you. Um, so Turner emerges as a coherent entity instead of being broken up into bits, which I think is very helpful. Um, yes, Matthew, what's your thought on that? Um, yeah, I, just reporting on the archive that I've been sort of uh, attending to, the early Turner is someone who consistently purchases fire insurance on his art gallery. And um, there's something of a hiatus in the kind of teens after a very intensive sequence of renewing these uh, policies with the sun. Um, Sam Smiles published this great piece about Turner's pub, which he acquires through family connections in what early 1820s, I believe it is. And uh, he there is, you know, this is a pub that is <laughs> catering to the coal whippers who are unloading uh, coal onto the London docks, so directly connected to these anthropogenic concerns that we've just been discussing. And he writes to his solicitor insisting that this is a space that is insured against fire. And then it begins to merge more explicitly with the legal fate of his, his art in being written into uh, the, the will, as I mentioned. Um, so and all of this in a period in which he's engaging with these charitable schemes, which he knows the alternatives are expressly appealing to a medicalized conception of life being developed by life insurance as life insurance is expanding radically in the early 19th century and it's spread in numbers and in numbers populations insured. So I guess there's a sort of way in which you could tell an expansion of the scale of operations sort of narrative, which might map onto the ways in which uh, early late career um, Turner has been framed, but my sense is that uh, the evidence, the evidentiary framework is not entirely consistent across <laughs> the Turnerian project, at least so far as I've found, but that it's, uh, there are repeated and sort of expanding thresholds of the engagement with the insurantial. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. And Orally, does does Turner's voice change um, from early, middle to late? And will it change in French, I suppose, is another question. That, that's a difficult question. So I'm at the beginning of uh, working again on that project. And uh, it's actually horrifying to go back to uh, what young me was translating and how it was doing that. Um, that's the whole question is how to make his own voice shine through without um, leaving things unexplained for the French readership. Um, I don't think his voice changes, changes that much. I think it's mostly the relationships that evolve and you can see that quite clearly throughout some of his uh, most, um, most often, uh, the letters he writes most often to a selection of um, correspondence. But uh, yeah, I, I actually don't know how to make his voice shine through the, the way that, um, I don't know, um, a, an audio or film representation could. Thank you very much. Um, so I've got a couple of specific questions. One for Sarah, uh, which is from Caterina Franciosi, um, who's enjoyed your paper and was wondering if you could reflect a bit more on how we might deploy eco-critical and eco-materialist methodologies to works that are not specifically landscapes. So you know, the, the wider range of Turner's um, uh, historical subjects, for, for example, or um, the, the, the works that concentrate on society, history, and empire, for example. So is it a matter of representation of landscape, or could you um, extend your critique to the whole of Turner's uh, output and all the different range of subject matter that he, well, the wonderful range of mind that uh, John Gage referred to? I mean, if we look at pigments and where they come from, their histories of extraction and pollution, um, yes, it, landscape don't matter that much. But in your question, you also mentioned uh, the slave ship. And I think that one way of reading the slave, sh slave ship from an eco-materialist perspective is, uh, I mean, Matthew um uh, said it uh, already but this painting is really about 
um, the rationalizing politics of industrialization. And so um, the um, regime of cal calculation, obviously, um, uh, quantification of life uh, insurance. Uh, but it's about pushing, um, pushing slaves here uh, over, I mean, to the side, pushing um yeah slaves over the edge and today we outsource labor we outsource pollution and i think that turner's works really um bear witness to the beginning of this controlling filtering uh leo costello mentioned foucault the regime of surveillance and discipline and i think these um concepts are really generative here thank you very much well, I've got one big question. I notice we're, we're over our time deadline. I've got one big question for you all, and maybe we'll go in reverse order this time, um, starting with Aurelie, because this was about um, geographies. Which which geographies, how should we frame Turner geographically? Because we've had wonderful papers today that have placed him very specifically in, you know, Walter Fawkes' estate in, in Farnley Hall in Yorkshire and in the Oxford High Street, uh, or as a national artist in which he definitely framed himself that way is that, that way at times but now we have also a kind of european turner you know a turner who resists brexit fortunately um and then we have a global turner um and i'm wondering how you all in in your work navigate the the geographic framing of this artist, you know, it's also interesting in terms of the curatorial challenges. Is this is this a British artist for Tate Britain and the Yale Center for British Art, or is this a, you know, major world artist for the Met and the Louvre? Or you know, uh, uh, how do we how do we frame Turner geographically? And Aurélie, since you are actually moving across, um, you know, geographic boundary in your work, I wonder I wonder how you understand Turner in in, in geographic terms. This uh, is. Um, a big question. I think what really comes from teaching about British art is how very little uh, students know about British art. And that's why um, I think it's important to translate because English is still not that um, well mastered the language, at least not in art history departments. And um, uh, I've really been amazed at how little my students knew. So because they didn't come from Anglophone studies, they didn't know exactly what the Royal Academy was, for instance. So there's a lot of work to be done and to address these questions of Britishness, of exoticism, um, even if it's just across the channel. Great, thank you very much. Um, Matthew, sitting in semi-francophone Canada teaching Turner. When you describe me as a francophone, Tim, I was thinking of the sheer laughter that my children would uh, emit if, when they, and our wonderful French uh, collaborators here, if they actually had to hear my spoken French. Anyway, to your question, it's a great one. I mean, I, I immediately go to the kinds of regimes of visualization that are being produced in the period by the insurers themselves. And yeah. I showed these schemes, uh, this massive detailed map, an insurance map of London that's produced in the 1790s by Richard Horwood. And he does so, this is used standardly as um, a kind of evidentiary tool for identifying locations in social history and other domains are just casually referred to by art historians, I think without necessarily understanding or taking cognizance of the entailments and the connections with insurance. And similarly of the National Gallery and its deep historical embeddedness with insurance. And you know, if you think of who's paying Richard Horwood to produce these kinds of visualizations, which go on to lead a very robust life in the 19th century United States, which then become the basis of the terrible redlining maps uh, embraced by the US government in the 1930s and so on and so forth. Um, the Horwood is being paid by Phoenix Assurance, which is a confabulation of Caribbean West Indian sugar bakers 
who can't obtain fire insurance on their incredibly combustible um, and hugely dangerous industry. And they come together and they form their own fire insurance company called Phoenix. And they are active in the Caribbean and uh, the Southern United States and so on and so forth. And so if you're following the trail and the entanglements of insurance, it's uh, at once, it gives you a very concrete instantiation of London in the 1790s, but it necessarily connects you to the imperial colonial uh, holdings in the Caribbean and around the world. So I think that's essential to keep in mind. Yeah, and I think it, you, what you do is to place Turner not just specifically in terms of insurance, but more generally in a kind of matrix of global capitalism, which he's making sense of in some of his works, which I think is why why it's so fascinating to hear that. And it can be extremely specific to one or two streets in London, as well as connected to the plantations of Jamaica and the exactly, East exactly. India Company and you know all, all of these global enterprises. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, just a final word then to Sarah, who showed us the 1972 picture of the globe as this fragile little object hanging in space. Um, you know, where does Turner fit in relation to that? Where, where would you want to, how would you want to place him uh, geographically? Yeah, I'm not going to keep you uh, for too long, but I'm going to go back again to some of the things I, I, I said, but I really believe that we can write um, a global history of, um, to, I mean, uh, of, of where all of these materials come from, uh, where, so I mentioned uh, Indian yellow, but there's also ultramarine and all of Turner's pigments come from somewhere else. And um, there's this, and there's also, uh, if you think about the fact that the Timbora uh, eruption might have had an impact of, on how he represented sunsets. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. All of these, I think, all of these scientifically, uh, scientific studies or uh, uh, technical also um, approaches um, invite us to consider Turner more globally. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. That's a, a, a wonderfully concise statement, which opens up a, a world of possibilities. So let me conclude by thanking our three speakers um, and indeed uh, thanking all the speakers throughout the whole two days. And I will now hand back to Sarah Mead Leonard to uh, offer some uh, valedictory words. Thank you so much, Tim. And thank you, as you said, all of our speakers uh, today, yesterday, all of our chairs uh, and everyone who has been here listening in, sending questions. I know I have new thoughts. I know we probably all do. These conversations will continue as we move towards the 250th and beyond. I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes of it. And I think with that, I'm going to let us go on to our day. Thank you so much to, for joining us for the last two days. And uh, this program will be available as a recording in the future. So if you want to go back and revisit anything, if you want to send it along to anyone else who you think might be interested, keep an eye out for that in the future. Thank you so much.